Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to IDG Live. Today, finally, we are looking at Bloodraven, Brynden Rivers, um, one of the most fascinating characters in the entirety of the world of A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, he's somebody that, I mean, I've come up with many, many theories about um, this wonderful bit of artwork behind me by San Rixian um, is uh, just have it uh, on a t-shirt available if you're interested uh, when in doubt blame blood raven which is one of these things you can always fall back on what i want to do is unpick that a little bit now um is it fair to always blame blood raven is he behind everything um as you would expect, I've had a lot of questions from my patrons on this. Um, I've decided what I'm going to do. Um, it was suggested by somebody in the chat last week. I forget exactly who, but thank you very much. Um, I'm going to break this down into two live streams. Uh, so this is Blood Raven up to the wall, and then next time it's Blood Raven beyond the wall. So what that means, um, particularly for patrons, if you have been asking questions over on Patreon about uh, Blood Raven's life, um, after he sort of goes north of the wall, the Three-Eyed Crow, uh, the story that we have in A Song of Ice and Fire, all of that good stuff, your question will be answered, but it will be answered next week rather than this week. This week, I'll be focusing on um, his kind of official life, as it were, um, in Westeros, growing up, Hand of the King, uh, heading up to be uh, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. So that is uh, what we're going to be uh, covering uh, this time. As always, I will start off with a bit of an overview uh, of who he is, what 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 he did, um, and then we'll get into questions. I'll, I'll answer questions from patrons. I'll try and get to as many different questions as I can um, in the chat as we are going through. But there's a lot to get through. Blood Raven. He was born in the year 175 AC after the conquest, and he was born to Melissa Blackwood, who was the sixth paramour, the sixth uh, official mistress of King Aegon the Fourth, Aegon um, uh, the uh, Unworthy. He, we, we spoken about him yeah, probably a couple of months or so now. But just to remind you, he had this string of official uh, mistresses who acted for that short time that they were with him. They effectively acted as a sort of queen in the court. Um, he did have a queen, Nerys, um, uh, but. Uh, when he had a an official-ish mistress, um, then she would come to King's Landing and she would spend all her time with him until he had enough. Aegon IV is this kind of Henry VIII figure, if we kind of think of it like that. Anyway, Melissa Blackwood um, uh, had uh, three children by him. Blood Raven was the third. He was born Brynden. Um, Brynden Rivers, because he was bastard-born, and so he had the bastard-born name uh, for those who come from the Riverlands, and he had two elder sisters. Now, he became known as Bloodraven um, because he was born with a very distinctive appearance. He had sheer white skin, white hair, and red eyes, and he also had a birthmark on his right cheek, right side of his face, uh, that was wine-coloured and it was shaped, we're told, a bit like a raven. Now, George R. R. Martin has confirmed that it was more like one of those kind of like ink blot things where you kind of stare at it and if you want to see a raven, then you will see a raven. Um, Dunk, certainly when he looks at him, doesn't think it looks it's just a blotch, he thinks it does, but if it looked like anything, it looked a bit like a raven. It was sort of blood-coloured, so he became known as Blood Raven. And all of these great bastards got these nicknames. The great bastards being the the children born to Aegon IV by these mistresses, noble-born uh, children. And so we get people like um, Bittersteel and Shearer Seastar, and here we have Blood Raven. They all got these kind of cool-sounding nicknames. Um, he uh, was there growing up in court, and even after uh, his mother, Melissa Blackwood, 
came out of favor, lost favor with the king, she still, she had made friends in court and she actually hung around. And so Bloodraven grew up in court, which was quite rare because normally with the other uh, bastards, they, when their mother had fallen out of favor, then they would sort of go away and be replaced. Um, but Melissa Blackwood was liked, loved by many people. And so she kind of like got a free pass and, and, and managed to stay. And so he grew up there for just the first few years of his life until the year 184, which is the year that Aegon IV died. Now he had been getting older and um, fatter and less and less well. And on his deathbed, he legitimized all of his bastard children. So suddenly, Brynden Rivers, Blood Raven, became an official Targaryen. He kept the Brynden Rivers name, but he, he was officially recognized as being the son of the king. This obviously then meant that he could stay in court. Um, and while... Uh, Diran the second reigned, he grew up in court. Diran the second was uh, the king who was there for the first Blackfire rebellion. Now, the first Blackfire rebellion didn't happen uh, straight away. It has to be said, um, we looked at this, there were a number of reasons why this didn't happen straight away. It, it took 12 years after the accession of Diran the second for the Blackfire rebellion to happen. So by that point, Blood Raven is 21. So he's not he's not old. I mean he's he's no longer a child, but he's not old even by that point. However, um he comes out fully, fully on the side of Deer and the Second. Now there are lots of different reasons for this. Uh I will perhaps dig into a few of these as we go, but certainly one of them. This is what uh, Barristan Selmy tells us. One of them is that um, his lover, the woman he seems to have been pretty obsessed with, Shira Seastar, was also desired by Agor Rivers, one of the other uh, great bastards. And the power behind the throne or the, the rival throne of Damon Blackfire. And Barristan Selmy very clearly says that that rivalry between the two of them led to war. And certainly it was Bloodraven who alerted the king to the fact that Damon was about to declare. Um, so he, as much as anyone else, was responsible for the start of the war. Was Damon about to declare? Well, we don't know because he was kind of forced into it after uh, Blood, uh, Blood Raven had outed him like that, um, and that did lead to the war. During that war, we get the decisive battle of the Redgrass Field. Now, at the Battle of Redgrass Field, um, the way it's often remembered is this military manoeuvre, the, uh, the, the hammer and the anvil, where Damon's forces are kind of caught between uh, two forces from the Loyalists and the Deeran Loyalists. But the early decisive bit of this battle was Bloodraven taking his troops, his archers, up onto the top of a hill and then raining arrow fire down onto Damon's forces. This killed Damon Blackfire, the, the Blackfire Pretender, and his two sons, his two eldest sons. Um, that turned the the tide of the battle. It could have gone either way, but at that point, the the Blackfire forces started routing. It was only when Agor Rivers then rallied them all, bitter steel. He rallied them all and got them back into the field of combat. At which point, Blood Raven had come down to the battlefield himself, and one-on-one -on -one fought Bittersteel. Now this, I would love to see this on screen, this was a an absolute grudge match, as far as we can tell, uh, the two of them, and Bloodraven had by this point got Dark Sister, 
the second of the Targaryen uh, Valyrian steel swords, and Aegor Rivers um, had managed to pick up Blackfire. So we've got this fight of, between these two huge rivals with magnificent legendary swords. Uh, Aegor Rivers' bitter steel gets pushed back. The army does get defeated. However, Bloodraven suffers a really bad wound. Uh, his eye basically gets cut out. So from that moment on, he has just the one working eye, and he, he doesn't, like many people seem to do in the world of Ice and Fire, he doesn't like put an eye patch over there or put something in there. He leaves it open, this red wound of where his eye was, which added to this kind of mystique and scariness about him. Um, he did sort of often have his hair kind of like just falling over it, um, uh, which I'm sure it was, uh, was quite affected. But um, from that moment on, um, he seems to have uh, grown in favour, probably even before that, with Deiran the Second. Deiran the Second was friends with his mother we're told, and was one of the reasons why uh, Melissa Blackwood stayed in court. And he seems to have, uh, Bloodraven seems to have kept that loyalty. And he also seems to have, during this period, become known as the King's Sorcerer, the King's Magician. He is starting to get a reputation for being a magic user. Now, Shira Seastar, we'll talk about her as well in a moment, his, uh, his lover, um, also gained a reputation for being a magic user. Um, and uh, as did Aenys, King Aenys, who um, was not initially the heir, but did eventually um, take over as king. Aenys I, who you will remember was generally perceived as being a, quite a weak king, but perhaps that's a little bit unfair on him. Um, he certainly seemed to be quite good at delegation, but the, the thing about him most of all was that he became very, very focused in on magic and the higher law and reading um, and discovering old prophecies. It's almost certainly him who just rediscovered a whole load of prophecies about the Targaryens, about the hatching of dragons, things like that. And he and Bloodraven became absolutely firm, the two of them, firm friends, to the extent that when Aenys did take over as king, he appointed Bloodraven as his hand of the king. Now, um, this caused some problems. Makar believed that he should have been um, king. He, depending on who you listen to, this is one of the sort of the, the subplots within Duncan Egg. Um, he then sort of went off uh, and sulked for a while in Summerhall. Some say uh, perhaps there were other reasons for that, but he definitely absented himself from court for quite some time. However, when Makar became king, he allowed Bloodraven to continue as Hand of the King. So um, we get this image of Bloodraven growing up in court and then rising in power and influence. He starts off as the court magician, the court sorcerer, the court advisor um, on all things um, uh, magical. Then he becomes Hand of the King, and he also becomes the Master of Whispers. He becomes the Spy Master. And it, it reached the extent where, under Aenys, he, he became feared. And his knowledge of what was going on across the land was so great, people were starting to turn on their neighbours, expecting there to be informants everywhere. People said that this wasn't just the fact that he got an informant network, but also... He could turn into animals. He could uh, he could hear whispers from long away. He 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 had a thousand eyes and one. They said the one eye plus a thousand other seeing eyes across the kingdom. So he became this near mythical character, even within his own lifetime. And he, as hand of the king, made a number of really quite big calls. 
Um, early on, when Anise took over, we had the um, Great Spring Sickness. Lots of people died, like a third of the people in King's Landing died. He made judgment calls to um, to get all the bodies burned. Um, there was a, a great drought that followed this. People wanted to leave to go and try and find food, water, uh, employment elsewhere, and he was he was putting a blanket ban on people uh, leaving home. Um, he was making these strong calls. They were starting to get raids on the Westerlands, but he was from the Iron Islands, but he was ignoring that, people said, because he was so focused on when's the next Blackfire Rebellion going to be happening. The, the next Blackfire Rebellion did happen, and we saw it in the third Duncan Egg story, um, or what was probably going to become the second Blackfire Rebellion, um, when we get the tourney at White Walls. At that, basically, Duncan Egg stumble into this um, and discover what's going on. And Blood Raven, however, obviously knows what's going on. And he encircles um, the insurrectionists and basically stops the plot before it actually gets anywhere um in in that he then um he, he takes the the rare position for him of not immediately killing the blackfire pretender he he has a history through this you see of personally killing blackfire pretenders but he doesn't he keeps him alive because he knew he was the heir and he knew that bitter steel who hadn't come across would find it a lot harder to make some to call somebody else an heir over in essos and launch another invasion if the heir from bitter steel's perspective was still there alive in king's landing so we had the second Blackfire Rebellion, we had the third Blackfire Rebellion, and through all of this time, you have this... Um, I, I, I struggle for the right word. Coincidence is probably a, an underplay of Targaryens dying unexpectedly, getting themselves out of the line of succession in some way. Now, some of these we see. We see... Um, the death of Baylor Breakspear. Um, uh, we see a lot of you know what happens with the Blackfires. A lot of it, however, happens sort of off screen, um, choking on lamprey pies, that kind of thing. Um, there are so many during this quarter of a century or a bit more. The Targaryens died at a rate of about one a year really and there's there weren't huge amounts of talk yes the targaryen family was getting quite big at the time but it wasn't huge and that really winnowed it down to just this one line at the end which was aegon the fifth egg and he was known as aegon the unlikely because no one expected him to inherit he was the fourth son of a fourth son the fourth son of a fourth son does not expect to inherit, um, but he did. Um, and how he inherited was because all of these other Targaryens had died, and the king died, Makar died, and everyone was looking around, well, who's going to take over now? So Blood Raven says, okay, we'll have a great council to decide this calls a great council all of the lords of the land come in um and they debate what to do as a an aside um the latest blackfire pretender um wrote very courteously it would appear to say hi i'd like to stake my claim peacefully um i'd like to come to the great council but could you guarantee me safe conduct and blood raven wrote back and said of course no one's going to hurt you um and i guarantee this by in the name of the king, whoever the king will be. Uh, and so across comes another Blackfire Pretender, and obviously Blood Raven immediately kills him. Um, but in the Great Council itself, um, a number of names were suggested. This is where Maester Aemon was put forward as a possible um, king, and he said no. 
Another couple of names were suggested, one of which was just a baby, a child of Aryan Bright Flame, who everybody went, well, if he turns out anything like Aryan Bright Flame, we do not want him on the throne. And it's just a child. We don't want to have a long regency. Um, and there were also a couple of uh, female potential uh, people, but they were very swiftly uh, moved over, leaving the only possible option of egg. Aegon V. Aegon V, his first act, though, was to recognise the fact that Bloodraven had been Hand of the King for nearly a quarter of a century. However, he had given the king's word that somebody would have safe conduct and broken it. And what this means for the king is that he thinks that now people are not going to trust. If, if Bloodraven stayed as Hand of the King, then nobody would trust the word of the king anymore. So he felt that he had to punish him for this. Um, he had to get back the reputation of the crown. And so basically he then ordered his, um, uh, or convicted him to die, but then said, you can go to the wall. He goes up to the wall, but he doesn't go up alone. This is a huge, and I, again, I hope we see this in uh, the Duncan Egg stories, because this was the biggest influx of new people going up to the wall to become members of the Night's Watch for a long, long time. Uh, we had 200 people heading up at that point. We had Maester Eamon who was going up, who decided that the way that he was going to support Egg was to take himself out of the situation so nobody would try and rally around him as a potential alternative um, uh, king. Uh, he was going up. Uh, Dunk went up, just, we're, we're told, as part of the honour guard uh, going up there. Maybe he had other reasons for going up. We'll, we'll hopefully find out one day. And also, it wasn't just Bloodraven who went up, but his uh, a whole load of his raven's teeth, as they were called, his personal guard, all volunteered to go up to the wall with him. Now, why is that important? Well, this means that when this group comes up, Maester Eamon was the obvious choice to be their maester up at the wall. But then the moment that we get a vacancy as Lord Commander, we know that you get elected as Lord Commander in probably the closest thing that the Seven Kingdoms has to a democracy. Um, the, the members of the Night's Watch all vote on who's going to be the next ruler. And he had brought in a mass voting block with him and he became the next ruler uh, the next lord commander of the night's watch so that was just so we're back on our timelines here the great council was 233 um, and he was sent up to the wall in the year 233 uh, so that is when he was 58 by this point so he was not a young man when he went up to the wall. It took him another six years to become Lord Commander, and then he was Lord Commander for another 13 years beyond that. So um, I don't know what image you had of what he was like when he did go north of the wall. As I say, we'll talk about that bit next week. But he was not by that point a young man. Um, he had lived a very long life and was pretty much a legend. But uh, we don't hear huge amounts about what he actually did as Lord Commander. I'll talk about what we do know um, in a little bit. But that's kind of like rounds up and summarizes um, uh, what we uh, what we know history all the way up uh, to the point where he goes up to the wall. So I think now what I will do is I'll try and pick up, uh, let's see, I, I think I had some questions in the chat. Um, I may well have missed a few. I'll try to go and pick them up. Um, Elhem saying, love this. Do you think Bloodraven trained Euron? That's a question that I will cover in more depth next week. Uh, so I'll give a very quick answer uh, here, but then um, uh, more next week. I don't think he trained him. I think that he called to him. Um, and I think that um, uh, that is why Euron has got all of this kind of crow imagery and things like that um uh 
question from uh, Mike Hannah. Oh, hi there. Um, the first super chat from you. Didn't see a question attached to that one, um, but I will try and pick that one up. Let's see whether I can find these um, uh, old, uh, not old, previous super chats from just uh, a little bit ago. Um, that I missed. So we've had uh, Mara Lee. Hi there, Mara saying, uh, sending early happy birthday wishes to Dan the Handsome Dog, as well as to Bilbo and Frodo Baggins on Hobbit Day this coming Friday. Um, will you be providing any Lord of the Rings content in honour of the day? This time I have to admit, yes, yeah, so for those who don't know, um, every year, uh, September the 22nd is Hobbit Day. It's the day that Bilbo and Frodo had their shared birthday, which is Obviously, the the opening of the of the, the Lord of the Rings, and to celebrate that, the Tolkien uh, YouTubers tend to produce uh, videos, release them in a playlist, a joint playlist, um, and uh, on a, a theme every year. Um, I do normally do that, um, and I will definitely be linking out to the playlist. Uh, I'll, I'll tweet it out and things like that uh, when it comes out. Uh, this time, unfortunately, I haven't had time to get involved. Um, I've had a lot of things going on. Uh, but yeah, I will definitely be uh, linking across to that. Um, and I think I had one other question, which was uh, Kieran McGee saying, I've been really looking forward to this one. My question is, as a bastard son, why is Blood Raven loyal to the Targaryens and so vehemently not the Blackfires? What is his motivation um, in his early political life? Okay, so, I mean, I think there's two layers to this, one of which we will uh, dig into quite a lot as we're going through this, which is his, the, the extent to which and, and how over time his understanding of what he is wanting to do and manipulating to do with prophecy to do with the prince that was promised and things along those lines um that definitely started to come through during this period however uh, there are a couple of things that i would pick up on why was he so strongly on Diran's side not damon's one of them one of the reasons um i've already mentioned uh, was the fact that he was a bitter rival of bitter steel. They hated each other. There's a very clear um, argument, and it makes absolute sense when you read around what happened, that the driver of the Blackfire Rebellion was not Damon Blackfire. Y yes, obviously he was the figurehead, but the real person pushing it was Agor Rivers. And um, you... If with a moment you realize Agor Rivers and Blood Raven are bitter rivals over a woman, Shira Sea Star, then you think, of course, he's going to oppose him. Of course, he will be on the opposite side of, uh, to Bitter Steel. So I think that's one good reason. Another layer to that, I think we have to say, is there is, for those who have read a lot into the sort of the Song of Ice and Fire world, and if I say there's a Bracken and Blackwood issue going on here, you will understand it. This pops up so many times, again and again and again. It's never been the centre of all of the focus of the action, um, but it's always something we hear about. Those two families for millennia have been at each other's throats. And uh, in fact, actually, in House of the Dragon, you may remember there was just a very brief scene uh, which... I, I hugely appreciated, I have to say, um, where we get uh, what was then Princess Rhaenyra uh, was uh, out receiving potential offers of marriage, and you got a Bracken and uh, a Blackwood uh, basically fighting, I think even fighting to the death, um, in the background while she walked out. Um, this is something which has been going on for a long time. The Bracken-Blackwood thing came to another head during the reign of Aegon IV. Aegon IV being uh, the father, of course, of Bloodraven and Bittersteel. Now, Bittersteel had been the uh, son of Aegon IV's fifth um, paramour, his fifth official mistress, who was a Bracken. 
So we have um, uh, a, a Bracken, who's the official mistress, um, who then gets, she gets kicked out and replaced by a Blackwood. And obviously the Bracken pride is really hurt by this because uh, suddenly the Blackwoods are in, you know, everybody loves the Blackwoods now. Um, so much so that the Brackens went away and they just did plotting. How do we, how do we get around this? What, what do we do now? Um, they said, well, okay, we just need to, we need to train someone up to, to be the next mistress who can get rid of uh, Melissa Blackwood. So they did. They trained up another Bracken to become the next mistress. And it was um, it was just this real rivalry between the two houses, which spilled over into the children of those um, two, uh, three even, um, uh, mistresses of Aegon IV. And then another level you can add on to this is the fact that Melissa... Blackwood was described in the world of ice and fire. She gets described as the most loved mistress. Um, not just we're talking, not I say not just by Aegon the Fourth. I think there's an argument probably she wasn't the most loved by him, although she did stick around for a little while. Um, she was most loved by the court. She was loved by uh, Neris, his wife. So the mistress was loved by the wife. Um, and also um, uh, Aemon the Dragon Knight, uh, who was fiercely loyal to Nerys, probably in love with her. Um, and also Diran, the future Diran II, who was uh, her son, Nerys's son. So the Blackwoods, from the very beginning, got in on the side of Diran II. Um, and this was therefore not going to be a surprise to anyone that Blood Raven was coming out in support of uh, Deeran uh, and against Damon. Uh, okay, um, let's have a quick flick through. Was there was there a question, Mike Hanna, attached to that one? Um, I can't see it, but I'm sure if you put it, if you. If there was one, and then feel free to uh, put it in the chat. Um, or maybe, oh, maybe this is it. Is it significant that, like John, uh, John Snow, this is Blood Raven grew up considered a bastard who then becomes legitimate and is a mingling of the blood of the first men and Valyrian old gods and dragons? Yes, I think it's absolutely significant. Um, uh, we'll get into this a lot more as this stream goes on but this is no coincidence he is half blackwood half targaryen um this is blood raven and what he wants uh, it would appear is for the uh the root line of rulers where the prince that was promised is going to come from descends from a targaryen and a blackwood blackwood their um first men family um, very connected with the old gods, um, because Aegon V married a Blackwood. So this is not a coincidence at all, even slightly. The prince that was promised it would appear has to have some Targaryen lineage and some old men lineage. Um, so let's go to... Uh, I think I have another question here. So, yeah, username redacted. Um, if the show is an inkling of what George R. R. Martin intends for the books, why would Blood Raven allow Craster to sacrifice his kids to White Walkers? This is a show oversight or what? As, as this happens, I mean, uh, so why would Blood Raven allow Craster to sacrifice his kids to the White Walkers? Um, as, it, as it happens, I've got a a video I'm making. I, I made this ages ago and then completely forgot about it, like two years ago, and then completely forgot about, about Craster, um, just working through exactly what's going on with him. So the bit we do not know is uh, what happens to Craster's children after. Um, it appears very clear. Here's me spoiling my video that's coming out in about two weeks, I suspect. But it seems very clear that Craster had not got some kind of deal 
with the the others with the white walkers he thought that he was just offering up a sacrifice to get right with them uh so he was leaving out his his sons but also if he didn't have a son um and he could feel the sort of the the cold wind coming he knew the others were close then he would leave out a sheep or if he didn't have a sheep then he'd leave out a dog um so this was not like some kind of deal this was just him offering here here's a sacrifice um so what we do not know is the extent to which uh, what happens to them afterwards is the same in the books. The only thing we have to go on there is the fact that one of Craster's wives talks about the sons returning uh, when the army of the dead is coming towards them. Uh, what that means, we haven't had that unpacked yet. Um, why would Bloodraven allow that? Um, well, Firstly, Bloodraven doesn't know everything. He might, he simply might not know that that is going on. Um, and secondly, it might not be as significant as on the show. Maybe they are just killed and turned into whites. Um, uh, which, hey, everyone's getting turned into whites north of the wall, so it might not be quite as significant. So uh, there, are, there are a few reasons why uh, Bloodraven may not have been dealing with it. Um, Karas Ballerina picking up a question for Luna Cascade. Thank you so much. I love it when people do this. Uh, question Hello, Robert. Hi there. Uh, what was the first time Blood Raven first used his magical influence before going to the wall? Well, we're not told an exact first time, but um, certainly uh, by the time that Dunk sees him. And actually, I've got a question about this. This is a fantastic scene. By the time Dunk sees him uh, riding into King's Landing, when Dunk was just a child, um, he describes him as the King Sorcerer. So by this point, he's already known as being a magic user. Um, and by that point, he's still in his early 20s. Um, if you go back even a little bit further than that, you can say that you can see that when blood raven and his archers were firing those ar arrows down on the uh, battle of the red grass field people said about him that he used his magic to guide the arrows which seems to imply by that point his reputation as a magic user was already out there as well um unless that was retrospectively um uh, sort of thought of um and that was when he was 21 so uh, i think the clear implication is that he started getting into magic earlier than that, but we just do not know what the first thing was. Um, uh, reflective rambling, picking up for the Brothers Arda. Hi there, both of you, actually. Um, who is your favourite Blood Raven era? Um, uh, favourite character from this time... I mean, it's. I mean, Blood Raven. Obviously, I'm absolutely fascinated by Blood Raven. But the more I'm getting into it, I'm also fascinated by Shira Sea Star as well. I think uh, she is um, a lot more important to this than we probably realise. Um, and I say that for. I mean, I'll perhaps talk about her a bit later. Um, uh, and I will definitely do a video about her as well at some point soon. But uh, she is so clearly a magic user that um, when Dunk and Egg are discussing magic users, um, and Egg is normally, he just, he just like swats aside, bats aside any kind of like uh, bad rumours about uh, his family. Um, and Dunk sort of says, have you seen, have you seen any like princesses or, or, or noble Targaryen women uh, doing any of this sort of, Magic and, and Egg just but says, Yeah, sure, Sea Star does it all the time. Um, and it's like, Okay, so she, I think, was probably the center of huge amounts. And the fact that we do not know what happened to her is so suspicious. Um, obviously, the maesters don't record what happens to the female Targaryens as much as they do the male Targaryens, and we haven't had Fire and Blood Part Two, but. Still, it's, uh, yeah, I find her an absolutely fascinating character. Um, so, 
have a look. Uh, Lem saying, off topic, do baby whites grow if sacrifices are childlike on the show? That's that's a question that we're all asking. I wish I had an answer to that. That's the um, the, the clear implication uh, from what we have in the books is that they don't, a white is something that is dead um, and then, then is reanimated and they're no longer growing. So uh, if you're growing young at the time, then you would not grow as a white, is the clear implication. Um, what they did on the show, uh, I mean, who knows there, they didn't explain that at all. Um, okay, let's go to uh, what I just mentioned a moment ago, Diego Godoy. Hi there. Uh, hola. Sorry, apologies. Hola, Robert. Hola. Uh, what did Blood Raven see in Dunk? when they stared at each other in King's Landing uh, when uh, Dunk was a kid. Right, so I've got the quote here. This is um, Dunk remembering back to um, when he was a child in King's Landing. So this is before Sir Arlen of Pennytree has, like, tweaked him out and said, hey, you can be my squire, um, which just completely, by the by, the more you think about it, the more random this is. Did Arlen, Sir Arlen really just go, um, there's the hundreds of stray kids around here, I'll take you. Um, maybe he did, but it's, it does seem a little bit odd. But um, Bloodraven, during this time before that, he comes into King's Land, he rides in, um, he's on a, a pale mare, which immediately sets up... Um, Book of Revelations references uh, for for the biblically minded. Um, uh, he's he's got a bone white skin. Um, he's wearing uh, I think it's crimson and smoke uh, smoke colored cloak, which seems to be like one of his favorite things to be colors to be wearing. Um, and basically, Dunk is just absolutely. You can tell he's he remembers remembers every detail of it, even years later. And he's, he stares at him. Everybody's staring at Bloodraven. And then we read this. He stared so hard that Bloodraven felt it. The king's sorcerer had turned to study him as he went by. He had one eye and that one red. The other was an empty socket. The gift Bittersteel had given him upon the red grass field. Yet it seemed to Dunk that both eyes had looked right through his skin down to his very soul. Um... So, I mean, what are we to make of that? What did Blood Raven see? First of all, why did he turn? Uh, and secondly, what did he see? Uh, I, I think we have to say, first of all, the fact that Dunk doesn't um, really analyse this any more than that is not really a surprise to us. Uh, Dunk through these stories is the i mean dunk the lunk thick as a castle wall he he does he just keeps on wandering through all these situations without always understanding exactly what's going on particularly when it comes to targaryens he just doesn't get it when you get the mystery knight he basically has um the the person who's about to launch an entire coup give him this um uh, long spiel about all of his prophetic dreams about it he overhears another couple of people just basically saying the entire plot and it doesn't it just washes over him he doesn't really pay much yes he's had a few drinks at the time but he doesn't really engage his brain with what's going on and we see that again and again through these stories so the fact that he doesn't seem to engage with this huge amount should not surprise us um but i do think perhaps we need to um, say, so, well, Blood Raven is clearly magical, and he clearly has seen something in Dunk. Not not anything about who he is right then at that moment. Yes, he's he's going to be tall uh, for a child, but other than that, he's not particularly impressive. It must be that he sees something in him or something of his future, and I do wonder whether this is an instance where Bloodraven has seen him in his dreams. We've got three stories so far in Duncan Egg. In the first and the third, we get a Targaryen who, the moment that they set eyes on Dunk, they go, I've seen you. 
I've seen you in my dreams. And I wonder whether this is the incident in the second story uh, where that happens. Uh, because uh, they're in the drunkard, first of all, when we, we get uh, in the Hedge Knight does, and then John the Fiddler, Damon the Second Blackbriar does in the third in Mystery Knight. Um, here, this just feels like exactly what Blood Raven would do if he had seen this person in his dreams. And why wouldn't he see Dunk in his dreams? Dunk is hugely, why wouldn't any Targaryen? Dunk is hugely important and influential to the entire Targaryen family. He probably wouldn't think about this, but even in the three stories we've got, di as a direct result of Dunk's decisions and his actions, the heir to the throne has died. The uh, One of the other sons um, uh, who potentially could be in, in line is forced off into exile. He saves Egg's life a few different ways, but in particular by happening to be in one of only two bits of the entire continent where the Great Spring Sickness did not get to. Then he stumbles into an entire rebellion against uh, the Targaryens and, and has a rooftop chat with the, the pretender himself. He is hugely important to uh, the Targaryen family, as I say, just in those three stories that we have. So could Blood Raven have seen him in his dreams? Almost certainly. I would be surprised if he hadn't. And the bits of interactions that we've had so far with him and Dunk, it seems almost as if he knows Dunk is important, but perhaps he doesn't know exactly how or why yet. It's like, why are you here? What's what's going on? Um, so, yeah, that would be my guess. He just goes, he sees him and goes... I've seen you in my dreams. And what might happen in dreams is not just like a, here's a very clear picture of what's happening in the future. It could be uh, veiled. It could be clouded. It could be um, uh, images that don't make 100% of sense. But Blood Raven will have looked at Dunk and known that he is important. Um, Mike Hanna question. Uh, compare the two Targaryens with gemstone eyes. We hate Kinslayer Aemon, uh, love Kinslayer Bloodraven. Both did evil to place the desired family on the throne. Um, yes, so, I mean, there, there's a lot of links here. I mean, the, the gemstone eye, the, the thing with uh, Bloodraven is the fact that he generally didn't put something in his eye. He kept it... Um, as this open wound, almost. Um, but uh, yeah, Aemond, um, and we more often compare Aemon to Daemon Targaryen from uh, House of the Dragon, from the Dance of the Dragons period, um, because Aemon feels almost as if he's he's a bit of a Daemon wannabe. Um, but Aemon did indeed go to terrible lengths to, as he saw it, um, in a Targaryen civil war, make sure that the right person was on the throne. I think the difference seems to be that Aemon isn't really, he's not magical, he's not particularly subtle from what we've seen so far. Perhaps he's more subtle than his brother, but he's not uh, hes not a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. Um, Blood Raven is. Blood Raven's very happy if people just have no idea what he's doing. Uh, whereas Aemond, um as we see in the books, and presumably we're going to see in the show, um, he just gets higher and higher on his personal power. Um, and whereas, I mean, you can get a few thematic links, and obviously the losing an eye thing is definitely one of them. Also, basically ruling, um, but not in name which is what Aemond did. So when Aegon, in, in the book, and I should probably clarify here just for anybody completely new, the uh, the policy we have here on, on this channel and also on my main channel um, is book spoilers are um, okay. 
the books have been out for a long time. Uh, if you want to have read them, then you've had an opportunity to read them by now. So book spoilers are fine. Show spoilers are not okay. Um, so happily, uh, I don't know what's happening on the show. Um, I'm staying away from the, the leaks, really. Um, and uh, what they've done so far is pretty closely followed the books, but there is a lot of wiggle room in the books for, uh, for to allow the story on the show to go in a lot of different directions, um, particularly with motivations of people like Eamon. So I think we have to wait and see. But in the book, he basically uh, rules um, when Aegon, his brother, um, gets very, very badly hurt. Um, and Bloodraven basically rules uh while a niece he doesn't get very very badly hurt but he doesn't seem to have much interest in ruling himself um roman lakovets hi there saying do we know when george R. R. martin first began mentioning blood raven bitter steel sheer sea star and all the rest of it um that's a really good question. I will actually, I will, I will live um, check out in a song of ice and fire when the first mention of I don't know this is Blood Raven is, um, and that is in book four. Um, so um, that doesn't mean that he's not mentioned earlier. There might be mentions of uh, of Brindon Rivers or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I certainly get the impression that um, Blood Raven is a character who became much more fully formed when he was writing the World of Ice and Fire, as he did. It was quite a complex process getting there, but uh, and also the Duncan Egg stories. So this bit of history was referred to in the earlier books so we do get references to the blackfire rebellions and the like uh, but the importance of blood raven as a character is not really mentioned until a bit later obviously he appears this three-eyed crow appears but we don't really know who that is um so I think what I'm saying is that the, the concept of the character of Blood Raven and names and things like that will have been there right from very early on because the Three Eyed Crow appears, but all of the background, the Bitter Steel, the Shira Sea Star, things like that emerged later on. Um, <laughs> Comics Kids 2099 saying, I never managed to catch these streams. I blame Blood Raven. That's the right. Uh, the right uh, answer, I think, about that. Um, uh, and Northern Tommy saying, live check, do you have a digitized version of the books that allows you to search specific words? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, at the risk of giving away trade secrets, all I did there, quite literally, is I've got I've got Kindle on my laptop, um, uh, and I just searched for the word Blood Raven. Uh, so it, it may well be that it appears earlier than that and I just uh, mistyped it or something like that. But uh, that's uh, that's all I was doing there. Um, let's go to um, uh, oh, a great weird Oh, I love it when people in the chat sort of uh, suggest ex extra things. So from the first brand chapter, you have him playing with ravens and bringing corn with him when he climbs. Yes. So, um, uh, certainly the, the ravens have, um, th there's a lot of imagery with Bran very early on. Um, uh, but the same with the crows so i don't know i would have to look into this i always try and be honest if there's a there's a gap here i would have to look into when george R. R. martin uh, what he said about the genesis of that character the extent to which when we get the bran raven imagery as opposed to the bran crow imagery uh he is thinking about blood raven specifically i do not know that um uh, Martin S, welcome. I see you've just uh, got in the chat reflective ra uh, rambling. Welcome back. Um, let's go to a question from uh, 
J saying, hey, Robert, can you please discuss Blood Raven in the context of him being a Blackwood? Uh, and Murray D saying, who was Blood Raven's mother? I know she was a Blackwood, but that's about it. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to sort of talk about both of these. So I, I've talked a little bit about the Blackwood history. Melissa Blackwood, um, uh, she uh, so she was very light, as as we hear. She was very beautiful. Um, uh, the I think the the thing we're not really told is the extent to which the Blackwoods proactively put her in Aegon the Fourth's way, um, rather, as the Brackens seem to have done with uh, their daughters. Um, let's not delve into that too much, uh, but. Uh, the extent to which we we see the Brackens as being uh, very competitive here, there's no reason to think that the Blackwoods weren't. But um, I mentioned that the Blackwoods were uh, of the first men and very uh, connected to the old gods. A little bit of background if you don't know it about House Blackwood, because they are a fascinating family. They started off, we're told, up in the north. Um, they were one of the northern kingdoms um, and then basically fled south of the neck when the Starks started expanding out. The Starks were not always, we sometimes think of the Starks as like, oh, well, you have the, the first long night and then after that the Starks drawled the north. No, it took the Starks thousands of years to actually claim control of all of the north. They were big and powerful family certainly but we get all of the stories about these different um uh, kingdoms these different uh, powerful families one after another they were forced to bend the knee to the starks uh the uh, the blackwoods moved south and set up home in the uh, the riverlands they were one of the early kingdoms there and they kept the worship of the old gods going. There is, if you look at a map of the Riverlands, we often think of like worshipping the old gods. It's only north of the neck. But if you look at a map of the Riverlands, there is this kind of curve of places that are really uh, old godsy. Um, you you get um, old stones, which is obviously where Jenny of Old Stones uh, came from, Weirwood Trees, this is um, First Men territory. We get uh, House Blackwood itself. In House Blackwood, we get a, um, a Weirwood tree that is, I think the word Jamie uses to describe it is colossal. And he's seen the one at Winterfell and he clearly thinks this one's even bigger, which seems to imply that perhaps it's even older. I don't know, um, but it's dead. They, <coughs> pardon me, they claim poisoned by the Brackens. Of course, they would claim that. But um, this, this is Raven Tree Hall, um, and the ravens, uh, they nest there. They, they stay there overnight, every night. So when it gets to dusk, the ravens from all around the area come, and they sit in that great dead weirwood tree. And then in the morning, they all fly off. Um, they are um, magical and mystical and, and have an impact in lots of the most important um, moments in uh, sort of the history, particularly of the Targaryen era. The Dance of the Dragons, uh, we will be meeting Black Alley, um, Alison Blackwood, who is a hugely important uh, character there. Um, uh, so, yes, there's a huge amount of history, but the, the basic thing is... Um, the assumption, I think we can be pretty clear on this, that Aegon IV did not really go to the north all that much, um, if at all. Um, this this is how he met and came into contact with uh, worshippers of the old gods. Um, Carl Karsnark pointing out that Blood Raven is very much inspired by Michael Moorcock's the Elric of uh, Mel Melnibony, um, which is very true. Uh, yeah, he's a, it's a great. It's been a while since I've read them, um, but uh, really good little read. Uh, a lot of stories actually um, there, and he's this. Uh, without spoiling it too much, he's this kind of enigmatic, uh, magical figure with a magical sword. Um, 
who is also he has the same kind of coloring of as, as uh, blood raven yes yeah, almost certainly this is a uh, i don't know whether he's formally confirmed at george R. martin but the, the, the inspiration is pretty clear there um mike hannah saying i get confused about eyes george R. martin likes describing eyes he does he also likes um uh he, he likes uh, characters who have one eye he, there are a lot of one-eyed characters that he's got going on there. Um, Refractive Rambling saying, this isn't a charity stream, but it, as it is World Alzheimer's uh, Day, please, uh, if, if you have money, then the, she's left a few links in the live chat. Do uh, please go and check that out. Thank you so much. Um, an incredibly worthy cause. Uh, Paul Taylor saying, hi, Robert. Time travel in the show boiled down to... Everything you do in the past has already happened. Bran is the main culprit. What did Bloodraven make real? Um, well, I'll talk about this, I'm sure, a lot more in the second half. I'm doing, uh, for those who've just arrived, I'm doing the, the Bloodraven live stream in two parts. This is the first part up to the wall, and that after uh, the sort of north of the wall bit, uh, I shall do next time all the three-eyed crow and uh, and the weirwood network that kind of thing but um i will happily quickly answer this now um yes they in the show they definitely got this down as a, some kind of a closed time loop is that uh, something um as with a hodor is that uh, he had already brand does does something in the present uh, or in the past which makes the thing which has happened in the present happen it just you can't get out of it it's always going to happen however Blood Raven appears to be of the opinion, certainly in the books, he was, I think, in the show as well, is that you cannot change the past. Now, this is interesting, uh, fascinating. The, the ink, the ink is dry. Um, he's tried to contact various people; doesn't work. Um, all of that jazz is that seems to be his position, and this is fascinating because it means that he's wrong. Um, now, could he just be manipulating Bran? He doesn't want Bran to try to change the past. Um, but we know that Bran has a couple of times. He he calls out to, uh, um, his, he sees his father. He sees Ned in the Godswood, and he calls out to him. This is when he sees him through the Weirwood tree. Ned is clearly dead by this point, so this is him looking back into the past. And Ned looks up and is like, who's that? He hears Bran, so he has changed the past by his actions in the present, um, just in a small way. But this is definitely foreshadowing for some things to happen in the future. But this, the important point is that Blood Raven thinks that you can't. So, is this just that Bran is even more powerful than Blood Raven, um, and without any real training on this at all, he immediately goes in and can change the past? it's possible or is it that blood raven um simply is trying to get him not to change the past and thinks he can influence him that way by saying it's impossible um john buxton saying hi robert just curious as to what relationship you think blood raven and the ghost of high heart had if at all uh yes a good question um I, I have got some questions on this, but again, this is this is going to be next time. I will talk about this a lot more next time because um, this is uh, certainly after he's sort of uh, headed north. Um, uh, but I think the clear implication is, I think we've got two things here. First of all, um, the Ghost of High Heart is the Woods Witch. This is pretty much confirmed. The Ghost of High Heart is the Woods Witch who came down with Jenny of Old Stones uh, into the court. Now, um, she... Uh, the two clues are, the first one is that her colouring is the same as Blood Raven's. Um, white skin, red eyes. Uh, this is a, a clear, I think, a clear clue that this is a Blood Raven ally or somebody working with Blood Raven. He's controlling her in some way. It's the same, incidentally, with Ghost, Jon Snow's um, uh, direwolf. I don't want to get into all of that huge uh, digression there, but uh, I think it's pretty clear that Blood Raven does walk into Ghost um, at times as well. 
so that coloring thing is one clue we have and then we another is that she's just fitting in with what seems to be blood raven's plan um the only thing that we know that she does um before we get the whole um summer hall thing is that she um says very clearly that the line of the prince that was promised has to come from Jeheris's line, um, which is what it seems that Blood Raven was after all this time. So it's almost as if he's just sent her down. So does she know him? Perhaps not personally. Um, perhaps uh, she has just been, uh, she does seem to be, if not a child of the forest, then certainly related in some way to the children of the forest. She must be connected in some way. She certainly has uh, prophetic powers. Um, we see them when Arya comes, uh, uh, sort of meets her. Uh, so I think there's a connection there. Um, the exact line of causality, I think we, we don't know. Uh, Andrew Kay saying some of the displaced houses are fascinating. Blackwoods are somewhat the opposite of the Mandalays. Yeah, because the Mandalays were in the south and then had to leave and went up north and uh, uh, being um, very loyal to the Starks. Um, let's go to a question from... But where do we get to? Uh, yeah, Martin S. saying, Hello, Robert. Is the area north of the Wall, the real north, as the wildlings would say, as cold as the Forodraith uh, for the way in Middle Earth, so that's the um, basically the frozen north in Middle Earth. Um, I mean, I don't think we've got accurate temperatures, so we just have to go from the bits of action that we have seen. Um, uh, the Frod seems very cold, um, and it definitely can freeze over, however, the one time. Uh, the most famous time that anyone went up there out of out of we the uh the the remnants of the court of arthurdyne head up there um and they get in a boat to go south now the boat does sink uh presumably hit by ice but the fact that you even attempt it does seem to suggest that it's not completely iced over now the north the southern bit of of the north the bit which is near the wall is is not always covered in ice and snow uh, but the further north you get when you get up to the frost fangs then the clear implication is that that is and then you get um beyond that which the implication is where the others uh, are coming from. Um, that seems colder yet. Um, mm -mm. I think I did get another question in the chat. Here we go. Yeah, Jibber Doll. Oh, hi there. It's saying, do you think that Bran slash Blood Raven will change a big moment in the past, or is it more like what happened happened? Uh, yeah, I will come on to these more next week. Um, but uh, in terms of changing a big big moment in the past, I th my take is this is a closed time loop. So it is. This seems to be what George Martin works with here. So it's not that you can suddenly change a thing. It's just that you can see what the causality of that changed thing is. And I think that the bits of foreshadowing we have is what leads up to um, Hodor. So I think that is the the big thing in the past that they that they're going to be changing. Um, Luna Cascade saying, uh, as Hand of the King, uh, did Blood Raven strike fear into fellow small council members? What did he do in those instances against his enemies? Example, please. Um, well, we don't have examples uh, because we don't have huge amounts of information. Um, but uh, whether he, he struck fear into everybody is what we're told. Um, so uh, I think the short answer is yes. But we don't during that period because we've not had Fire and Blood Part 2 because... Uh, what we the, the main thing we have is the world of ice and fire, um, and then just some sort of outside looks into it uh, from uh, Duncan Egg. Duncan Egg um, 
don't really have much of a view of what happens in the, the small council. The world of ice and fire is focused more on the kings, actually, rather than uh, Blood Raven. So you just have to sort of see Blood Raven um, working his way through the narrative. So uh, no, we don't have examples of this, um, uh, but I think it's pretty clear that he did. Um, let's go to a question from uh, Magma Frost thirteen. <coughs> Pardon me, saying hi, Robert. As a green seer, Blood Raven presumably experienced green dreams, but did he experience dragon dreams as well? Are the two as truly different to begin with, um, or, or would they be better considered different genres of the same magical phenomenon? Um. I, I think um, I, I think I might have had another question about this a bit later, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and wrap this one up um, here. Um, are dragon dreams and um, green dreams the same thing? I, as far as we can tell, no. Um, the uh, the weirwood magic seems to come almost from a kind of a a collective consciousness of the continent, as it were. The weirwood trees are expressions or, or, or bits of the continent of Westeros. Um, that seems to be where they come from. Uh, the green dreams that we see um, tend to um, operate a lot more on a... Um, one person putting something into somebody else's mind approach is, is one thing that we have seen. So uh, Bran has green dreams that Blood Raven seems to be influencing. Um, the uh, They don't seem to be necessarily related to who you are in the bloodline. Dragon dreams, this seems to be... a, a something to do with your Valyrian inheritance. George R. R. Martin deliberately keeps these things vague. He doesn't like it if if magic is explained. He says he's said this plenty of times. He thinks that the uh, the danger and the beauty um, uh, and the fear of magic lies in the fact that you do not understand exactly how it operates. Uh, so we can see the outlines of how this works, but he will never tell us exactly how it works. So the way he thinks of it is that the moment that you know in order to produce this this effect over here, you have to do these things, then that then becomes just like a science and it's not magic. And I kind of sympathize with that uh, writing perspective. Um, the So dragon dreams clearly seem to come to Targaryens. We, we don't know about... Uh, and they're not just dreams of dragons, um, the, which perhaps is different to what Tyrion gets. We'll have to wait and see on that one, I guess. But uh, dragon dreams are dreams um, that are prophetic, in a sense. Um, we've seen a few of them, certainly on the show, um, uh, that when we've seen... Um, uh, Helena, she has been getting prophetic dragon dreams and visions and things like that. Um, in the books, we get people like Deer and the Drunkard. He certainly seems to be getting dragon dreams. And some of these are packed with imagery. It's not 100% clear um, all the time what it is. You know, I saw you on a field and a dragon fell dead on top of you is not 100% clear. It's, you can probably interpret it, but it's not. It's not just a literal view of what happened. Um, and then when uh, John Fiddler, Damon Second Blackfire, talks to Dunk about his dreams, these are, again, these are dreams of futures, but they're not necessarily the futures that you would interpret. So you're getting snapshots of different things. So they seem to come from different magical sources, um, and they seem to be slightly different in, in what they are. Um, let's go to a question from Michelle Raimu saying, or oh, Raimu, um, I have been waiting for this stream for so long. Um, well, I'm 
glad I've been looking forward to it too. When do you think Blood Raven realized he was a green seer and had the magic for the old gods in him? Is it possible he had a visit himself from a former three eyed crow or maybe a visit to the Isle of Faces? Uh, so we, we a little bit ago, we sort of mapped out clearly his reputation as a magic user. Uh, suggests that he must have been using magic since you know, the teens at least uh, because by the age of 21 um, people were already talking about him using magic on a battlefield so um, that means that he must have been doing it beforehand um, so uh, yeah certainly in his teens he seems to have grown up with a whole load of people who were fascinated by magic, um, particularly Shira Seastar, um, and also Aenys the first, um, sorry, Eris the first. Um, so, uh, the um, he seems to have sort of headed in that direction probably from quite a young age. My best guess is that probably the, the green dreams came first. But he did grow up more within the Targaryen context than he did uh, the Blackwood context. So, um, uh, if the Green Dreams happened, then I suspect that people would have had to say, "Well, these don't. This doesn't seem to be Targaryen magic. Uh, maybe we need to investigate what's going on." with this and why that is. Perhaps it's coming from your mother's side of the family rather than your father's side of the family. Um, could he have had a visit from the former Three-Eyed Crow? I think personally no, for the simple reason that, um, and again, we can do that, talk about this next week if you're interested, but the Three-Eyed Crow is not a job title. Um, the Three-Eyed Crow is and so it's not something which is like passed down. I'm the three eyed crow, and now I'm giving it to you, and now you're the three eyed crow. Um, this is effectively an avatar used in the green dream by Blood Raven. Now, the fun thing about this is that he doesn't know what he looks like in his green dream, um, nobody does. So, um, you have an avatar, um, effectively in, in the green dream world. So Bran seemed to have been a wolf tied down, uh, tied down, a wolf winged wolf tied down by chains. Um, but Jojen saw that and then headed off looking for it. Um, but didn't know even when he arrived that it was Bran, he had to like have a little think who, who might this be? Who's this being uh, a description of? The Three-Eyed Crow, this is what Bran was hunting for, because in the, his green dreams, then this character came to him as the Three-Eyed Crow, and so he was looking for the Three-Eyed Crow. However, when he got there and he talked to Blood Raven, and he was like, are you the Three-Eyed Crow? And then Blood, Lave, Blood, well, pardon, Blood Raven's like, um, uh, well, I suppose, yeah, that does make sense. <laughs> um, so he knows that you don't, your avatar you don't get to choose yourself uh but it makes absolute sense for him to be a, the three-eyed crow because he was a crow a, a member of the night's watch um and he's opening the third eye the magic eye uh so uh yeah that he thought oh yeah that makes a lot of sense um but yes oh you did ask about a visit to the isle of faces i I will admit, I'd not thought about this possibility before, but it's wonderful. I love the idea that he did. We we don't know. At the moment, we only know of two people in, in the modern-ish era of uh, Song of Ice and Fire, two people, um, Adam Valarion and uh, Helen Reed, who've been to the Isle of Faces. But it makes absolute sense that uh, Blood Raven might have done that as well. You get um, the... Raven Tree Hall is not that far if you look on the map from the Isle of Faces. So, yes, it would make sense that uh, if he was starting to grow in his understanding of his sort of green seer nature, then why not? He might he might try. Um, question from 
Uh, Commander Ray, oh, this is reflective rambling, picking up a question for Commander Ray, so thank you, saying, how did Bloodraven know that his actions would lead to the correct royal line if green seeing is not absolute in clarity? Um, well, I don't know if he did, to be honest, uh, but I, my, my best guess here, uh, and I think, I think maybe you sent a, a, a question on patreon linked to this um but the we've got a lot of people um involved and and the more we sort of say oh this is blood raven it's blood raven this it's not just blood raven at this point yes later on blood raven is more um you know uh, if you excuse the cross metaphor he's more of a lone wolf a bit later on but during this early phase of his life it's not like just him he's got like this brains trust of people uh you've got um eris the first who will become uh, him in a little bit who is there going he's obsessed with um books and law and learning about ancient prophecies we get shira sea star who were told also kept a library and was incredibly learned she had she knew 12 languages apparently uh, she seems to be a fascinating person and she clearly actively practiced magic to the extent that egg was like yeah of course she does um so it's almost like you've got this little brains trust of people who are there going okay so We've got these prophecies. We've got a prophecy about the prince that was promised. They've uh, probably got uh, uncovered the old um, Aegon's um, uh, prophecy. Uh, they've uh, probably mapped out all the way through Bloodraven. Um, when he's talking to Duncan Egg, he he's specifically says, you know, the Targaryens have been having dragon dreams well before the conquest. So it clearly they've been researching he knows that targaryens have been having these dreams all the way back to uh Daenys the dreamer when coming out of old valyria so they've been mapping out these prophecies um they've been figuring out uh the the sort of the magical bloodline of what is it that we're needing and i suspect they came to a conclusion that what they needed was um probably somebody that seemed to be quite a good person, but also they needed an injection of um, the first men magical blood into the bloodline. So that's where it ends up with Aegon V marrying um, a Blackwood. Um, all of these other people, they yes they could get them out of the way so is it um how did he know i think it's just um uh, you can look to see where they're ending up and it's it was i mean whether or not you put all of these down to blood raven is is up to you but i think it was reasonably clear that um you didn't want to have arian bright flame as the prince that was promised and probably not his line either um, similarly, you get a lot of people who, who are very scholarly and perhaps not looking like they might be fighters. Uh, Egg was actually, I mean, he, he didn't turn out to be like a master fighter, but he certainly was reasonably martial as well. So um, it, it's the Targaryens have got very, very strong characteristics, each of them. It's not like they're all much of a muchness. Uh, Deer and the Drunkard was incredibly different to um, Maester Aemon, was incredibly different to Arian Blight, Bright Flame, was incredibly different to um, Egg. They're, all of them have got very different characteristics. Um, so I think it was reasonably clear how you're going to try and um, bring this down. Um, added to which, there's always the possible possibility that they did literally have some kind of prophecy about the line um, of the prince that was promised. Maybe they uncovered something. Um, let's... 
go to a question from uh, Andrew K just adding to that saying, I also think in the text, the prophecy knowledge likely somewhat more widely known in Targ circles than just monarch to heir. Egg as a boy and all his brothers uh, knew in that generation. Yeah, this is the most magical generation in all of the Targaryens. This is not what we've seen on screen from the Targaryens in House of the Dragon, yes, there's a couple of people you think, oh, well, they're a bit prophetic and things like that, but that's nothing to hear. Here we have openly magic, uh, openly sorcerous people, people who's who are obsessed with prophecy and research. Uh, everybody there is a dragon dreamer, basically. Maester Aemon said, I had three brothers and all of them had dragon dreams and all of them died of it. And it's just like, this is the magical era for the Targaryens. Um, let's go to a question from Johnny Targs saying, to what extent do you think Bloodraven was able to look into the future? Um, Lady Pushkins, you also asked this. So, uh, yes, we seem to he can perhaps look into the past, but um, can he look into the future? Well, um, sort of casting forward when when he's in the weirwood network when he uh, he says this a weirwood will live forever if left undisturbed to them seasons pass in the flutter of a moth's wing and past present and future are one nor will your sight be limited to, to your godswood so he's the the hint there is through a weirwood tree it's all one time is just one for a weirwood tree so yes you could look in the past but you could also look into the future uh, so that's the hint that he gives bran uh green dreams do seem to have the potential for uh seeing some stuff in the future dragon dreams definitely have the potential for seeing stuff in the future but so we have lots of these different things if we're trying to kind of create this patchwork which i think we should with blood raven it's not just that he was just like i'm a magic user of this one thing um he had lots of different types of magic going on um and when you get that patchwork you get lots of different ways of potentially seeing things in the future um but i think we have to balance that against something else he said later on uh, which is um, he's talking about the future and he says the sea of shadow that is all we know of the days to come so the clear implication if he's talking about looking at the future he calls it a sea of shadow he doesn't say you can't see it he doesn't say it's you know it's impossible to make anything out but it's it's shadows it's it's hard you can just sort of vaguely pick out a few things that's the kind of feel that we've got here lots of different avenues lots of different possibilities but it's not as if he's got this clear roadmap going through of exactly what's going to happen when uh, and to who um let's just very quickly as we're uh, an hour and a half in or so um patrons thank you um i always frame these live streams around your questions because i cannot do what i do without your support and i'm hugely grateful um if you would like to support the channel the best way to do that is by uh, is through patreon and there is a link uh, i'm sure somewhere in the live chat appearing around about now uh, there will be appearing a link down in the description as well it's uh, patreon.com slash um also moderators you are amazing thank you so much you do a fantastic job uh lots of people in the chat today um uh and if you're enjoying the chat and it's feeling like a good and safe place for you that's because the moderators do such a fantastic job so if you are in the live chat please show them a little bit of love they definitely deserve it okay um let's get back to um the questions um a quest, couple of questions in the chat. Um, Kieran McGee asking, how is this generation so magical if dragons are dead? Well, it's a really interesting question. Um, and it seems to imply that the, the magic of Targaryens passes down through them, not just through the dragons. Now, dragons do definitely, the presence of dragons definitely adds to 
what I sometimes call the sort of the ambient level of magic in the world. When the dragons come back, um, then Danny hears that, you know, all these other magicians um, who use fire magic can do so much more. The pyromancers, they they actually it's fantastic uh, when they they ask Tyrion. They say, um, "This is suddenly it's got so much easier to make all this wildfire." Just a random question: Have you heard of any dragons back in the world? So they clearly understand that having dragons in the world adds to this ability to do magic. However, the Targaryen dragon dreams does not appear to be connected. Um, you can even go as far forward as Danny. So dragons haven't been around for, by that point, a, you know, a long, long time, 150 years or so. Um, and she is getting dragon dreams before her dragons hatch. So um, having dragons around is not a prerequisite uh, for it. Uh, re re reflective rambling picking up for Egret Weirwood. Um, uh, two wonderful people. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dragon Dreams versus Relor Visions. Um, oh, interesting. So, if we're talking visions in the flames, um, what, a, what a compare and contrast them, I guess, uh, is the question here. Um, they are both quite similar in as much as they um you can see things bits of understanding um however seeing things in the flames seems slightly more directive maybe it's just that melisandre is good at this she she seems to be like you know i i want to see a certain thing and she certainly sees that you know i i asked to i asked to see azora high and all i see is snow kind of thing this is um clearly uh her um guiding the vision in some way and also it seems a lot more open about what you can see uh, as as well as it does intriguingly it um uh it f has the same kind of feel bizarrely as as green dreams in that it uses a lot of imagery she she looks and she sees um uh, a, a man with a, a wooden face and a, a child wolf i think it is which is blood raven and bran um which makes absolute sense but she obviously doesn't know exactly what it is so there is a comparison there dragon dreams seem to be literal dreams that you have at night you don't seem to be controlling them you don't seem to be directing them you just get these dragon dreams um and they can start to take over so um you get dear and the drunkards the classic example he got so many of these dragon dreams that that's why he took to drink because it was just it was just happening to him. There, does, there doesn't seem to be so much control over it. It's not an intentional thing. It's just something that happens to you. Um, John Buxton uh, saying, is there a weirwood equivalent in Valyria? We know of the shade trees in Essos. Uh, feel free to skip this if it's irrelevant to the stream. Thanks. Um, uh, is there a weirwood equivalent in Valyria? Well, so, so the shade of the evening trees are there in Essos and they they are the uh, I mean I, I don't know how far to go down the, 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 there's some fantastic theories about what they are but yes that they, they definitely seem very similar to the uh, the weirwood network and weirwood trees um might there have been any in Valyria we're not told of any um uh, we're not told of there being any uh, particular trees that are there what they have instead and this is actually i mean we kind of skated over it because there was so much in house of the dragon uh but 
remember George R. R. Martin had a key role in House of the Dragon. He wasn't just like there, um, sort of sitting at the side and waiting for them to send him the uh the the video once they'd made the whole series he was actively involved in discussions and he was definitely will have been had cleared through him that wonderful bit when we get uh, good king viserys um showing off a bit to, to alicent about old valerian you know his big model that he's been uh he's been making or his people have been making and he's been playing with um and he just he comes out with this kind of like throwaway line. He says, uh, uh, "Here's the the volcano at the heart of Valyria. Um, then the the dragon riders uh, had their homes basically built in to the volcano, the source of their magic." And it's like, "Whoa, hang on a moment." So this is the volcano is the source of the magic. So if you're looking for an equivalent to a weirwood tree in Valyria. This is the volcano. This is the source of the magic. We haven't got more details on this yet. Hopefully we will get a little bit more, maybe through House of the Dragon. Um, I don't know. But um, yeah, that's that. if I had to pick an, an equivalent, that's probably what we're uh, talking about. Um, let's go to a question from ld saying what was the public understanding of magic during the any days was this a high prevalence of magic a scandal with the public or the faith so um we're not told much of the faith are pretty quiet by the at this point um they obviously were when we had baylor the blessed in charge then they were um very important and the we get the great sept happening but from that moment on the faith seemed to turn from being this um very uh sort of righteous fury kind of organization to uh, they become institutionalized really so we don't hear huge amounts about what happens during this period with uh, with the faith um uh, the clear implication is they don't actually do all that much. In terms of the people, how did they view magic? Badly. Uh, they didn't like magic generally. There's there's nothing that's said um, which we read about. When you read Duncan Egg, this is, is one of the good things about, uh, about hearing from Duncan Egg because they talk to normal-ish people. And the when blood raven comes up it's like oh yeah he uses magic kind of thing it's like this is something mysterious this is something people don't understand it doesn't seem fair um one person using magic um so yeah it's not viewed well it has to be said it's not um in the same way that at different points if somebody was perceived as being a magic user they might immediately be killed because these people are in power uh and that i think is the important thing is that it was literally the equivalent of the prime minister the the person who's running the country who is accused of being a magic user and if you the way it's described is is very much like a um police state is that people were scared of talking badly about blood raven because they would get killed their neighbors might turn on them so uh it's it was not viewed well this magic using but uh people didn't feel they had the power to do anything about it um Andrew Kay saying, I think the visions via different magical mediums indicate a magical nexus, often foretelling the same events or people and even seeing each other. Yeah, it's a really interesting um, uh, sort of approach. My, my general take is that most magic in George R. R. Martin's world, I mean, at some point, I've said this for years now, at some point I will do a video, like my overarching theory on how magic works in George R. R. Martin's world, but uh, most magic seems to come, we think of it as being separate chunks, this magic, that magic, the other. It seems to come from sort of the same kind of place. I, the um, the Weirwood Network magic does seem a bit different in that regard, um, but certainly fire magic as a whole seems to um, come from a 
similar-ish kind of place. Um, Martin S. Could dragons in George R. Martin's world learn to use magic um, in Melisandre or Thoros of Mere style? Probably not due to lower than human intelligence, but could they do it if they had greater intellect? Um, well, in just in terms of intellect of dragons, George R. Martin has said, imagine an intelligent dog. That's, that's where he's come from. Um, so uh, it's not... Then they're not capable of the hugely critical thought that magic seems to require, um, uh, but that doesn't mean that they're stupid. Um, so uh, if they were more intelligent, I guess so. Um, if they were like the equivalent of like Smaug and uh, the Hobbit, then yes. Uh, Mike Hanna, um, is it possible that because of the dragons dying, the magic transferred to the Targaryens? About a drag generation or two after dragons, we start seeing a greater number of Targaryens having magical abilities because of dragon blood. Um, I mean, I think it's possible, um, but I mean, may uh, I? My take is that we get we get a shift from um, what we had early on with the Targaryens, which is from what we've seen in Fire and Blood and also House of the Dragon, is that you had the main focus of the Targaryen dragon dreams and the like early on was Aegon's prophecy, the Song of Ice and Fire. We need to, ha we need to be in control of the seven kingdoms we need to be united the, the targaryens have to be here we're going to be facing a threat from the north etc etc that seems to be what the focus of it is then we get to the dragons going and suddenly the shift uh, i say this is an incredibly magical era but lots of this magic is focused on this same one thought which is just like drum 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 into these targaryen heads which we have to get the dragons back uh, how do we hatch dragons and then we see this in lots of different ways all over the place we get arian bright flame drinking wildfire we're told because he thought he would transform into a dragon. We get the tragedy at Summer Hall is because Egg is trying to hatch dragon eggs. Um, we get told that um, uh, all of the, the, the kings, this is fantastic line of kings, when we were going through the Targaryen rulers um, uh, after dragons have gone, you see them react in different ways one after another we get so we get deer in the first is there and say well we how do we do this invading dawn we don't have dragons and he says i am a dragon i am the dragon so he's like saying okay no it's me now that's it you get to baylor baylor prays over dragon eggs he tries to hatch dragon eggs too by praying for them we get Aegon the fourth we don't think of as particularly magical he tries to make dragons he has what can probably be best described as steampunk dragons, um, which he makes um, he just drive them into dawn, um, but they set on fire and burn down half the Kingswood. It's like each of them is just about how do we get the dragons back? And that remains the focus. And then the ones who are perhaps less dragon dreamy like that, they start researching it. So this is where we get any sense. He's, he's researching how do we get the dragons back? Um, so uh, where was I up to? I think I've got a couple more questions in the chat just now. Um, Kirsty Angel saying, could Blackwoods originate from Children of the Forest um, uh, Pact um, making fertile with intentions of using men as weapons against their own um, and sacrificing their hybrid children to kill all Targaryens via dragons and royals. Blood Raven equals sacrifice. So could, uh, if, I, if I'm understanding this correctly, could Blood Raven killing 
Targaryens, he, and and he, even if you do not buy into this idea that Blood Raven was the person behind the dramatic and statistically improbable reduction in the number of Targaryens during that period, he definitely was single-handedly responsible for killing Blackfires. He, whenever he could, he killed the Blackfires personally. Um, he didn't even leave it to anyone else to do. So definitely he was doing that. Is it possible that uh, the the Blackwoods originate from um, an idea of making uh, using men as weapons against their own and sacrificing hybrid children to kill all Targaryens via dragons? Um, it, it's possible. That's a long way. Ago. I mean, if I if I've understood the the thing you're suggesting, um, uh, I, I personally think the Blackwoods as a family are just what they look like. Um, I think they're fascinating. Uh, I think they're really interesting, but I think they are the f uh, the first men blood family who was in the north, has come to the south, and has stayed loyal to their uh, beliefs and traditions, uh, which has allowed in the south there to re retain a small foothold around that kind of area of uh, the uh, worship of the old gods. Uh, Raven's Oath. Uh, did Blood Raven accept the wall because he viewed his mission as complete, or did he go to continue? Uh, does that not absolve him of Summer Hall? Um, right, so did he go to the wall because he wanted to? Or did he think he was done? Um, I th personally, my best guess is a bit of both. I think if you if you believe, as I do, that what he was trying to do is he was trying to create this line of uh, Aegon the Fifth married to a Blackwood, and then their children. This is where the um, the children, uh, the prince that was promised line was going to come from. Um, that he could, the moment Aegon was on the throne, he could do that, uh, with the small exception that he then needed to make sure that the bloodline from his perspective remained pure, which meant that the children had to marry each other. Um, and that happened because of the Woods Witch, which we talked about a little bit earlier, saying, ah, these two here have to marry each other. Because actually, um, you, I mean, we don't tend to think of it like this, but when you get down to even as far as Daenerys, the Daenerys that we know, her parents were siblings, their parents were siblings. So actually, she genetically is getting the same genetic code. I know it doesn't, scientists don't at me, but high level, she's getting the same genetic code that was actually comes from Egg himself, Egg on the fifth, and his wife, um, uh, his Blackwood wife. So Daenerys is from that exact line that Blood Raven set up all that time ago at the Great Council. Um, so we're so close to this story um, already. So uh, did he think his work was done? I think he probably thought his work was pretty much, I mean, he can come he can do more, but it's pretty much there. Um, could he have been behind Summerhall? I think that's uh, uh, maybe, maybe we'll touch on that one next time because that's when obviously when he's he's gone north. But um, is it possible that uh, that he could have been behind it? Yes. Does it fit in with uh, the the plans that we think he has? ish um and it's it's probably fair to say that once we'd already got to this point where uh we know the line of succession duncan targaryen the firstborn son of egg is out of the line of succession um uh, also due to perhaps to the Woods Witch. She came down with Jenny of Oldstones. Jenny of Oldstones is the reason Duncan is no longer in the line of succession. Um, but what happened at Summerhall was actually, it didn't, didn't change the line of succession. 
is probably the, the smoothest way of putting it. So yes, Egg died. Yes, uh, his son, his firstborn son, Duncan Targaryen, died. But Duncan Targaryen was not going to inherit anyway. Jaehaerys was always going to Jaehaerys the second was always going to be inheriting. This just speeded things up by uh, Aegon dying perhaps slightly earlier than he was going to anyway. So um, we could. I, I said I wasn't going to talk about this in huge depth, so I will. I will stop in just one moment. But you have to accept that there is always the possibility that this was just Egg doing the thing that he said he was going to try and do, and it going a bit wrong. Um, but it doesn't absolve if, if the answer to direct answer to your question, this does not absolve Blood Raven from um, being behind Summerhall. That does not mean that he was, but it does not absolve him from it. Um, right, let's go to a question from um. Mike Hanna saying, Danny has the blood of all the races of Westeros, question mark. Yeah, I did a video on this ages ago. If you trace this line all the way back, yes, we've got the Blackwood line, which is the the, um, the first men. Uh, but also we get um, little bits of uh, the other ethnicities in there that we get from. You can go there and find that we get the... Arryns are, are there, so we get the Andals, uh, we get the Martells, uh, so we're, we're getting all of the different uh, ethnicities of Westeros and the magics of Westeros, which all come in to Danny. So that's um, and not just Danny, all of the children of uh, Eris and Leia. So that's um, uh, I, I think I said fascinating, makes them representative of Westeros as a whole. Um, which kind of has a kind of magical ring to it, I think. Right, uh, let's go to Mike Hannah because of uh, Blood Raven question mark. Yeah, so uh, assuming that's a follow up to your previous question, yes, I did. If you want more on that one, then um, please do go and check out that video. Um, let's go to question from. Uh, 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 where uh, Naberios saying, is there a specific moment when Bloodraven comes to believe he is a man of destiny, charged with saving the world, if that is what he believes? Or was it something that was always there, or was he just constantly edging towards it with each decision he made and action that he took? Thanks again. Love the t-shirt. Oh yes, great chance to plug the t-shirt. Um, this, If you like this design, then this is a t-shirt which is, should be available down if you're watching this or there should be a little bar of stuff i'm rubbish at um uh flogging my own merch but um i didn't design it uh it was the excellent sam rickson who did so i'm very happy to say i think it's amazing and it says um when in doubt blame blood raven if you're interested in that have a check out of the thing down there but um uh, the was when did Blood Raven believed that he was a man of destiny. Now, th this is this is something we can't know. I don't think. My guess is that he thought from quite early on, as part of this kind of brain trust of people of Targaryens who were obsessed with the prophecy, who were obsessed with magic, who were obsessed with this idea of the prince that was promised, bringing dragons back, etc., etc. Um, I think that he thought that he knew more than anyone else or they knew more than anyone else. And so they are the people who have to be really running things behind the scenes to make this happen. Now, what happens is, though, that these people all die or disappear. Um, and uh, Shira Seastar, we don't know what happened to her. I have my suspicions, but we don't know what happened to her. So Blood Ravens then is left on his own. Now, does that what he th clearly thinks that he knows all of this stuff and he has to somehow influence events a little bit more? He doesn't seem to be the kind of person who wants to just uh, step aside and let others influence events. So, heading up to North of the Wall, however, hooking himself up to the Weirwood Network, I, I personally think when you 
when you listen to what he says, he's actually he's a lot more humble than I was expecting. Um, I if if you run into a really really um, ancient tree wizard who can see back through time, um, who has been influencing events for decades upon decades. Um, that's not how he comes across. It's he thought it says, uh, yes, so my mother named me Brindon kind of thing. I did, you know, I loved these people. It's it's almost wistfully looking back, as if he is he and half the time he sort of like drifts off as if he is being caught up within the Weirwood network. So I think that by the end he is less of himself and he's part of a greater whole. I think at the beginning he was less of just himself and part of a greater whole of people who were trying to achieve the same thing. It's just that middle bit when perhaps he thought, oh, it's on me now. Um, let's go to uh, Thomas Kalish uh, saying, thank you, Robert, for the years of entertainment, especially your Traveler's Guide series. You're very welcome. Uh, any thoughts on the upcoming show uh, recasting Blood Raven? Um, well, in, in terms of, uh, if you're talking the upcoming show, I assume you're talking about the Duncan Egg show. Um, and just a quick update, uh, for those who are interested in what's going on there. So yes, we, before all the strikes started happening, we did have confirmation that the Duncan Egg show was going to be going ahead. Um, uh, it was going to be done in a season per story, at least to start with. So they were going to be adapting the Hedge Knight first. That was the, the first draft of that was, I think they said six episodes, um, which kind of, I think, works for me. Um, uh, the... I mean, the more I think of it, that I'm, it is, you can pack a lot into that story um, uh, without padding it out with extra stuff, if that makes sense. I wouldn't, I think it would, we wouldn't last a full 10 episode series. So, um, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, the, George R. R. Martin was actively involved in writing that. He wasn't the writer, um, but he was actively involved in talking to them. Um, but everything is shut down that's so that's where we we're at now with the writer strike there's no writing happening uh, they had a good first draft but it clearly was still a long way away from being finished um because they were saying at the, at the moment it's six episodes which is the kind of thing you say if you haven't finally bottomed out exactly the story you're telling um but uh that's where that's where we're at that means that we we can't expect it um i mean even if the strikes ended tomorrow, um, then, I, I mean, I wouldn't expect it for the next couple of years, probably another three years, to be honest. But casting, I'm terrible with casting um, ideas. He shouldn't appear until the third season anyway, um, and then only really at the very end, although he probably appears... Um, Spoilers, probably appears in disguise earlier on in uh, the third uh, one. Yes, he almost certainly does in the third book. But um, I, this is where I always go to the chat, because I know people in the chat will have much better ideas than me on, on casting. Um, uh, let me know. I will, I will read out some of the, um, uh, the best ones. And Thomas Cash, thank you. that was your first super chat, so thank you so much uh, for that. Um, question from Martin S. Were dragons a wild species at some point before being tamed by the Targaryens? If so, what would happen if someone stole an egg from a living dragon mother? Would the dragon mother hunt them down? We we don't we don't know all of the backstory to dragons. It's left George R. Martin leaves these things to sort of legends, but the implication is that um, the uh the the bond to dragons was something developed by the targaryens 
perhaps dragons themselves were kind of genetically manipulated. The Targaryens seem to love this kind of genetic manipulation, pushing different kinds of creatures together. Um, it probably something predates even the Targaryens uh, and even the Valyrians, I should say, going back even further to um, empires further east. Um, but uh, would a what would happen if someone stole an egg from a living dragon mother? I mean, this is an interesting one because the 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 Targaryens clearly seem to um, happily take eggs from the dragons that were their dragons, and that's the dragons seem okay with that. Um, on the show, they had these, you know, the, the, they were holding these. I don't know what they filled with hot rocks or something like that. That you know the big uh, iron-looking uh, contraptions that they used to carry the eggs around in, um, which I thought looked really good. We weren't the books don't give us the the logistics of how that happens, but they certainly would take out dragons' eggs and then put them into the uh, the crib or cradle of a new um, baby Targaryen, which and the dragons don't seem to care about it. So um, yeah. And I'm sure a wild dragon would be slightly different, but it does seem to be different for um, uh, the, the Targaryens. Uh, Carlos Bowman is saying incubators, yeah. Um, let's go to... Um, uh, so, Reflective Rambling saying, what age Blood Raven are we talking? Um, well, so this is when he's Hand of the King. So we're probably talking when we first see him in his mid-30s, I would, would be what I would say there. Um, so that's the kind of... Uh, uh, able to sort of, like, carry on into their 40s, I would have thought. Let's go with uh, questions from um, the... Uh, my patrons um da, 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 uh, let's go for michelle raimu saying the brother blood raven loved uh so yeah jo when he's up um as the tree wizard um and he's talking to bran about looking back into the past and the powers and what you can do with weirwood magic um he says i had a uh you know basically a woman i loved a sister i loved a brother i loved and one i hated um it's it's very clear Agor Rivers is the one he hated. Um Shira Seastar is the woman he loved, um, but also is the who's the brother that he loved. Um Michelle Rhyme is saying it would be in true George R. R. Martin form to have it be Damon Blackfire due to the heart being in conflict with itself, but I think it's Deeran. Deeran kept Blood Raven at court even after Missy Blackwood uh, was dismissed by Aegon the Unworthy. Do you think it's possible? Blood Raven viewed Diran in more of a fatherly role, which is why he was the brother he loved slash defended so vehemently. Do you think that Diran saw the potential Blood Raven had, and that's why he kept him close at court before he officially became king? So a lot of questions there. In terms of the brother that he loved, I think, I mean, this is half-brother, um, but yes, I'm pretty sure it's Diran. Um, I agree that the idea that this might be Damon Blackfire is an interesting one, but we've not really had any hints um, in the text so far about that. Um, could, <coughs> pardon me, sorry, I got a bit of a cough today, so I apologise about that. Um, did he view him in a more sort of a fatherly role? Um, and did Deeran see Bloodraven's potential, uh, which is where he kept him? Around well, we have to remember first of all that Diran came to the throne when Bloodraven was nine, so uh, that's the dynamic we've got going on, and um, I think that there is clearly a sort of an an absence of father figure issue here. We don't tend to think about that, but you have Melissa Blackwood who was the, uh, the the love of the paramour, the mistress of Aegon IV. Um, but then Aegon IV cast her aside and got another woman in when uh, Bloodraven was very young. So um, what, uh, what sort of 
father figure does he have? Um, we're not really told. Diran is quite a lot older than him. Um, uh, so it's possible that that was the way round it was. It's possible that Diran saw something in Bloodraven. But the clear implication, I think, is that Melissa Blackwood became friends with the next generation up, Neris um, and Eamon. Um, and Diran then by extension, because he was Neris's uh, son. So I think that was the way it was. And But as Bloodraven grew up, then yes, um, Diran definitely saw his abilities. And so by the age of 21, he clearly trusted his word enough to basically go to war over it. Um, let's say, uh, let's have a quick flick in the chat, see if anyone's got any ideas. Mads Mickelson suggested uh, Sin. Uh, maybe too old, though. I envisage him as a young man. Um... Uh, let's see if there's anyone else here. Michael Fassbender. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, just trying to see if there's any more. Robert Pattinson would be good um, as a suggestion. Yeah, keep keep the ideas coming in. I'll read out any more um, interesting ones. Um, uh, Lem saying, do you think Bloodraven manipulated Arya into joining the Faceless Men? Um, no, I don't think think that's uh that's what happened um uh, i i is i mean this is going slightly off topic um uh, i i is journeying was around the riverlands basically um and uh, so whereas blood raven may well have been aware particularly because um that there are more weirwood kind of impacts than you might think where the high heart where she is this used to be a place of um uh, i think it was something like 30 something weirwood trees in a sort of a circle in a grove they all got chopped down uh, years ago with the andal invasion but that's still a very um uh, the weirwood still have effect they give a sort of weirwood dreams to people if you sleep on them um also, uh, you get Beric Dondarrion. When we first see him, he's sitting in a weirwood throne, really. Um, so the the weirwood network are there in Arya's story, but that's not really where her story has been going. She's not being guided uh, through this by Bloodraven. Um, I, I think this is a separate thing. Um, uh Noah Holland saying, would Paul Bettany be too old uh, for the role? I think he's too old for it now, personally. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a younger Paul Bettany would, I, I think, would work uh, very well. Let's go to... Um, uh, Lem just asking if the small man with a big shadow could be Blood Raven. Um, uh, this, I mean, this... That phrase actually comes out a few times, but it's almost certainly always about Tyrion. Uh, Charlie Schneider saying, I know this is larger than regular tinfoil theory. What if the battle between magic and the maesters is more a battle between the maesters and more specifically fire magic? Um, you've made videos showing the maesters as the possible reason for the downfall of Valyria, dragons, um, Targaryens, what if the maesters are the puppets of the walkers? Could Bloodraven, a known dragon dreamer and some ability of foresight, see that he could uh, be most useful to the realm at or uh, at the nor or north of the wall, similar to Bran Stark's calling? Well, uh, yes, uh, big tinfoil. I, th I think so. The maesters, um, just to pick off that bit of it, the maesters, yes, seem to be anti magic. Um, I don't think it's specifically one type of magic. There, there seems to be, yes, the, a lot of the things that they're talking about are um, fire magic, but they teach that um, the other magic has gone. The children of the forest have gone. Um, weirwoods aren't that important. When you get Maester Lewin and he's teaching uh, particularly Bran, yeah, he's basically he's got yeah. You know, there might have been magic; they might have existed, but they don't anymore. So they they seem to have the same approach across the piece on uh, magic. Um, 
But could Blood Raven have seen that he could be most useful to the realm um, at or north of the wall? Yes, definitely. Um, uh, but I wouldn't wish to overplay the uh, the others. Sorry, the any link between the others and the um, maesters. Snowgal. Um, I feel like the plan to winnow down the Targaryen family tree is excessively risky. When you go from dozens of Targaryens to just a handful, there's a chance the line will die out entirely, as almost happened. Do you have any idea why Blood Raven feels like the only way to get to who he wants on the throne is to kill everyone else? Maester Aemon is a good example of why this needn't be the only way. Also, Duncan marrying Jenny and taking himself out of the line of succession. There are other less homicidal ways to do this, so is Blood, Blood Raven just a psychopath? Well, Blood Raven clearly is uh, what I think he would consider to be a pragmatist, the greater good kind of person. Um, and he is very happy to kill people for that. Because, and in, there, there's an echo with Melisandre here, is that they both think that they are doing exactly the right thing. They are, they are serving the greater good. Um, and if along the way they have to um, do some bad things, well, that's necessary. So there is a kind of an echo going on between those two there. Um, as for the killing everyone, I th this is interesting because, yes, Targaryens die very regularly during that period, but that's not the only way, and not all of them appear to be um, uh, Blood Raven's fault. Now, you've already talked about Maester Aemon coming out of the line of succession, um, uh, Duncan Targaryen taking himself out of the line of succession, obviously he died a little bit later anyway, um, but then you get some people who, so Arian Bright Flame, for example, that seems to have been what I suspect we would now call death by misadventure. Um, you get, um, we, we talked quite a lot about Baylor Breakspear a few live streams ago, and unpacked that actually it's not as obvious as it seems, not as straightforward as it seems, um, how he died, but Unless we get more information, then we have to put that one down as largely accidental. It's sort of certainly during combat, but um, uh, there was no intent there, certainly from Makar, to be killing him. Um, people dying in the spring sickness is again, I mean, was that Blood Raven? Was that just people died in the spring sickness? I think if no Targaryens died, that would have been more suspicious. So I think that there's a lot here that you go, actually, yet this isn't necessarily all Blood Raven. So, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that every single Targaryen who died during that period was Blood Raven. He definitely proactively went after the Black Fires. I don't think there's any way around that. He personally killed, I think, five of them. Um, so that definitely is down to him. As for the other Targaryens who died in mysterious circumstances, might he have been behind them? Quite possibly. It's quite possible that he just sort of put a little nudge in here and there just to be pushing events along. Um, so uh, on that first point, uh, him killing all of them, it wasn't, I, I don't think it was him killing all of them. Um, Blackfires, yes, the, the others, not necessarily. Um, is it a bit risky? Well, he he waited, if he wanted to get it to uh, Egg, he waited until Egg um, was married with children, basically. And uh, once you get to that point, you think, actually, all we want is this one line that he ultimately got it down to. And if he thinks that the Prince of the Promised is a prophesied thing, then that will happen. So um, I think from his perspective, no, it wasn't risky, because that was what the prophecy said had to happen. He just had to make the prophecy happen. Um, Lem saying, going along with my last chat, could Blood Raven end up connected with Tyrion. His last Sivas piece is a dragon that ends up pale red like a weirwood tree. Um, 
uh, could he end up connected with Tyrion? Um, my instinct is no, um, but perhaps via Bran. Now, what the, the reason why I sort of hesitated over that is in terms of sort of plot reasons, Tyrion is obviously at the moment he's over in uh, Essos, so he's going to be teaming up with Danny, and Danny will be or is being pushed along by Quaith, who seems to be sort of the equivalent um, of Bloodraven to John, Quaith is to Danny. Um, so he's more connected over there. Obviously, at some point, He's going to come back over to Westeros. And when he comes back over to Westeros, will he be heading up to the wall? North of the wall? No. I don't think personally he will be heading up there. Bran, however, it's possible that he could meet. Now, the the sort of the pause before I was working my way through all of that is because Tyrion's role, Tyrion has many roles in this story, but one of the roles that George R. R. Martin has for him is the link between all these different strands of story. Um, Tyrion hasn't met everybody in this story, but he's met way more than almost everyone else. Um, most of the characters are following their own little arcs, doing their own thing. Tyrion has been moving about all over the place. He's, he's We first meet him in Winterfell. He meets all of the Starks. He meets Theon Greyjoy. He goes to the Wall. He meets with the Night's Watch. He comes back down. He goes up to the Eyrie. He meets everybody, the, the um, uh, House Arryn and what's going up there. Then back down, obviously, he knows the Lannisters already. Back down to King's Landing, connecting with Littlefinger and Varys. And, and um, uh, he connects in with... Uh, Oberyn Martell literally dies for him. He's connected in with the Martells. He's connected in uh, with the Tyrells. He has good chats going on up there. Then, obviously, he leaves. He hooks up uh, or, or meets up with um, Illyrio, and then we get um, Fagon, John Connington, so he knows about what's going on with them. He then meets up and he's turned meeting up with Team Danny, and he's going to be at the center of Team Danny. With um, he's already met Jorah, but he's going to be meeting Barristan and Selmy, he's going to be meeting Daenerys. Uh, so Tyrion is the character who joins all of this together, he's the person who knows all of these different people. There are a few small bits, uh, of, of this that he hasn't personally met but they are still small bits um so that was the re <coughs> pardon me the only reason why he was um i was thinking that is there going to be a connection there i can't see it but Tyrion generally is a connection uh, across to um most other characters um let's go to um Ben Barnes, some people are saying. Interesting. Um, this is casting for, for Blood Raven. Um, let's... I've got, I think I've got another chat here somewhere. I can find it. Yeah, Martin S. In the Game of Thrones show, it seems Davos learns to read fairly quickly for being grown up. New language stuff seems quite a bit harder for grown ups, but maybe he's just a gifted man. Yeah, he did seem to... I mean, he learned in a matter of a few episodes in the uh on the show um in in the in the books i'm just trying i've not I've not quite reached there yet in my uh re-read or re-listen through uh so i'm having to stretch my mind back to how long it takes um he does uh he does learn to read but it's i don't think he ever gets to the point he's not like fluent um uh with with reading he it just takes him time Callie Summers, did Aemon choose the wall also to be safe from Bloodraven? Um, their love wouldn't stop Bloodraven from acting in the greater good. He later left the wall for safety too. So Maester Aemon, did he choose the wall to be safe from Bloodraven? Um, uh, da, 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 it wouldn't stop, stop Bloodraven from killing him in the greater good. It's possible... Um, but I mean, I th I I still think, given what we know of Maester Aemon, that 
it's he went there out of care for egg Aegon, which is what we're told. We're told that he went up because he'd been offered the uh, the throne, um, and people would have rallied behind him. There was a significant number of people who wanted him to be king, and it's not just that they quite liked him and thought he was good. They did not want Egg to be king. We will see this in later uh, Duncan Egg stories, I'm sure. But Egg is going to start throwing his weight around a little bit and interfering with what's going on with the nobles and having some very strong views about looking about the rights of the small folk compared to the rights of the nobles. And basically everybody knew if he became king, then he would be taking rights away from the nobles and he would be giving them to the small folk. And so the nobles who were electing a new king did not want him to be king. And so if an alternative were there, then people would try and rally behind that alternative. So Eamon going up to the wall, taking himself completely out of the equation, so he's now not only got one set of vows, being a maester, but two sets of vows, having joined the Night's Watch, that takes him out. So that works for me. I don't, I don't personally need another um, reason to be... Um, for him to be heading up. Um, but would he have been, I mean, he would have been aware of what Blood Raven was like. Absolutely. But I suspect that he actually, while they were up at the wall, allied himself more with him. They would have shared a fascination for, we know that Mr. Eamon loved prophecies and things like that. Obviously, Blood Raven did. They will have been the only two people at the wall who at all knew what they were talking about with this. So they 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 would have got close. Uh, Bill Skarsgård suggests, uh, uh, Igrit Weirwood. Um, yeah, I don't really know him that well, but um, uh, happy for other suggestions on that. Um, I think I'm caught up in the chat. Um, so let's go to some questions from my patrons. Um, Brandy1842 saying, Guten Abend, Robert. Uh, probably Guten Nacht, actually, where you are by now. I think we can all agree that there is enough convincing evidence that Blood Raven has been killing numerous Targaryens over the years and cutting down the bloodlines to the one he would expect Azora High to come from. But how did... He come to know about the threat from the others and the importance of Azor High in the first place and know who to kill and who to keep alive. Okay, so I've sort of attacked this from various um, angles, but so I'll try and pull this all together um, in the answer to this one. My, my take is that uh, he, he was magical himself and he was, he was getting dragon dreams and he was getting um green dreams and then he allied himself with magic users and people who became obsessed with prophecy in king's landing and they uncovered old prophecies prophecies and they were all targaryens getting lots of dragon dreams about dragons hatching again they uncovered old prophecies about the prince that was promised and this is connected in with Aegon's original prophecy. Whether or not Aegon's original prophecy they knew about at that time, it's not 100% clear. But um, it, it's... Uh, the Song of Ice and Fire is something that Rhaegar knew about. Now, that certainly seems to imply that somehow it must have got to him possibly through the woods witch um at uh, summer hall which is a bit a bit of a digression i guess um but that's how blood raven knew he knew about what was going on because he was with these people who were uh, investigating prophecy and law and ancient history and who were really good at magic so uh, that's the first half of the question. The second half of the question um, is, uh, how did he know who to kill and who to keep alive? Well, I, I, 
if these bits of prophecy and magic led him to this clear understanding that the 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 line that had to happen is from a targaryen and the first men uh mix and then he decided the person who best fits this is egg he may have discovered that he it was right at the beginning of the stream, but we he seems to he looked at Dunk and seems to have seen something about him. And given Dunk and Egg are that just so closely connected that when he sees Dunk, he must be seeing something about Egg as well in some way. But he may well have prophesied that that's the, the line that we have to get to. Um, uh, he may well have just figured out actually, you know what, this is this is the best bet we've got this guy here all of these other people let's face it some of them not really who we'd want to be king and they've not got uh the the potential to be great warriors so um yeah maybe it was uh a magical reason maybe it was just a i think they're the one um Uh, let's go to a question from uh, oh, Andrew K saying, as the profile uh, of the universe grows, it might get higher profile actors, but their general uh, modus operandi tends to be up and coming or transitioning stage to screen types. Um, yes. I mean, I think that the one, one thing I, 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 have to say for both Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon is that the casting has been top notch. Um, I I struggle to think of a bad casting that they've done for either of those shows. It's it's been really really good. So I actually trust them. And uh, you're right that a huge amount of the people are new, young, up and coming uh, actors. I th the age that we're looking for with the introduction to. Um, Blood Raven, he's probably mid 30s, maybe late 30s by this point. So, uh, what we're looking at is um, almost certainly not a completely new actor, but somebody, um, yes, yeah, stage to screen, I think is the way it, they, they quite often uh, pick up. So, yeah, I'm happy for somebody I've never heard of before. Um, but yes, uh, dream castings are all, always fun. Um, Let's go to Mara Lee. Hi, Mara. Saying, who were the Raven's Teeth that went with Maester Aemon and Blood Raven to the Wall? Um, there's a popular fan theory that one of them could eventually become Cold Hands. Um, so, uh, if so, do you think he became Cold Hands when Blood Raven got lost beyond the Wall? So, um, the Raven's Teeth, I'll explain. So, these are his personal guard. Very loyal to him. They seem to have been there from a very young age he was he had them during the first blackfire rebellion when he was 21 um they were the archers um and they we also see when he rides into king's landing and dunk sees him he's followed by these uh, raven's teeth um and they sort of go around with him from war to war and they act as his personal guard when uh, he gets sent up to the wall, a big chunk of them just decide to go with him because this they're loyal. They're his bodyguards, they're his soldiers, they're, they're not just random hired swords. So um, uh, they head up to the wall. I suspect that their votes were uh, critical in getting Bloodraven elected six years later to be uh, Lord Commander. And when he went north of the wall ranging, it wasn't on his own. He w did go with others, almost certainly will have gone with his raven's teeth. You asked about um, cold hands. I did a video about cold hands ages ago. Um, and uh, my overall conclusion is, yes, it kind of makes sense that this is a member of his raven's teeth, um, is, is cold hands. Is Cold hands is a former member of the Night's Watch um, and somebody who is absolutely trusted by Blood Raven, so and and if you go through um, 
actually this was Aziz from History of Westeros who uh, I think I did that video with him and he went through and worked out all of the clues we get uh, to do with um, how uh, how well worn were his, his Night's Watch clothes and things like that um, to try and figure out roughly what kind of time frame we're looking at here for uh, for him and it does seem to match up with roughly the time frame that it would be for when Blood Raven went north of the wall. So yes, Cold Hands being one of the members of the Raven's Teeth makes absolute sense to me. Um, let's go to a question from Dominic Osman saying, Hi Robert, many characters throughout the Song of Ice and Fire stories, Blood Raven especially, seem to think um, or think they, or seem to have, or think they have, legitimate knowledge of lost magic and/or prophecy. There are numerous passing references to ancient Valyrian scrolls and grand histories in the Citadel that do not appear on page, but we are told all the time that they're out there. Obviously, George R. R. Martin will never tell us exactly how many things, like deep history, magic, and prophecy, work in his story. But will any POV characters, Danny, Tyrion, Sam, get their hands on any of these hinted at lore rich materials? In short, how much of the magic or history of this world do you think will or has to be revealed? Okay, so yes, we keep on hearing about these ancient tomes of magic that are in various places. Um, in terms of where are we going to get this lore and knowledge and understanding from? Then a, a few places. People like Maester Eamon have obviously now gone. He could have imparted a lot of this knowledge. Um, but I think we will learn about this partly through Bran. I think that he will... You know, we've been, already been told he can go back in time and he's not going to be restricted to the Weirwood Network. Uh, he can travel beyond weirwood trees to see stuff. So we'll learn stuff through him. Sam, um, we've got so many things set up for the knowledge in the Citadel um, and uh, the fact that there, you know, there's a secret section that only a certain number of people can get to. Um, the Jack and Hagar figure uh, who's disguised as Pate seems to have got himself a key to that. Uh, at some point, I think Old Town's going to get attacked. Uh, but will Sam manage to escape with any books from there? I suspect he probably will. I think he will head back with some of this ancient knowledge. Um, uh, and then we get what's going on with Danny, which I think is the most fascinating part of this, because we know that George R. R. Martin originally wrote this story, had this idea of like this five year break. And you can see roughly where this is. He sort of shifted this around a bit to, to cover up the cracks of this. Um, but the original idea was that the, the main characters would end up in certain places and then stay there for about five years. The younger characters can get a bit older. The dragons can get a bit bigger. Um, uh, everyone can learn new cool skills and knowledge. Uh, and then we can return to the story. He abandoned that idea. Um, but it's clear that where Danny was going to spend her five years was a shy. And we can see some of the trail leading to that when you get Quaith saying things like, to go west, you must go east. And it's like, what, to a shy? And it's like, yes, that's where we need to be going. So she clearly was going to go to a shy. Um, but she's now not going to a shy. And George R. Martin has told us that we are not going to a shy. We might we might see memories of it or something like that, but we're not actually going to go to a shy. So where's she going to get this knowledge from? Now, there are two really intriguing things here. It's one person who could potentially maester Eamon is not happening, but we've got Marwyn the Mage who's appeared. Now, Marwyn the Mage, as well as having been down in uh, Old Town, therefore having a huge amount of knowledge from what's going on there. Also, once was in Ashai, learning things in Ashai. He is going to, he's deliberately going over to Danny. He wants to advise her. So that is one place that she may well be getting information from. The second is an even more intriguing one, I think, which is Tyrion. Now, Tyrion has two potential sources of information that he can give to Danny about... 
dragons, but also potentially about history. Tyrion is currently one of the world experts about dragons. Um, we know that he was obsessed with them when he was younger. We know that he's read every book about them that he can find. And he even wrote a book about them when he was on the Shy Maid with um, young Griff and all the rest of the gang. Uh, they basically said, write, write a book about all your knowledge about dragons for us, which is a thing that he did to pass the time while he was doing it. So he's got all this knowledge about dragons. But then, fantastically, oh, pardon me, we get this bundle of books. If you cast your mind all the way back to the beginning of this story, Danny's wedding feast to uh, Carl Drogo. And Sejora brings a wedding gift. He says, here's some books um, about, you know, history and things like that. Um, and they vanish from the story. And somebody once asked George R. R. Martin, so um, did she ever read those books? Uh, and George R. R. Martin had clearly thought about this. And he said, no, Danny is not much of a reader. They're, but they've been traveling around with her and they're somewhere in Marine now. And Danny might not be much of a reader, but do you know who is? Tyrion. And Tyrion is on his way there. So these books, which have been just sort of like carted around for the entire story, nobody reading them. Uh, Jorah may or may not have even known what was in them. Um, Tyrion's going to arrive. The clear hint here is Tyrion's going to arrive and he's going to read these books and he's going to gain some extra knowledge. So uh, are our POV characters going to learn this? Sam may well do. Bran may well do. Tyrion may well do. And Danny, she keeps on getting these random bits of information from people, Sir Barristan, Sir Jorah, whoever, about what's going on. Uh, but she is going to be bombarded with this information uh, from Tyrion and Marwyn the Mage and also Makoro, the Red Priest, who's been sent over there. Uh, so um, I think the short answer is yes. Um Commander Ray asking what was Blood Raven's tax policy, uh, which is a wonderful question. I always love these questions. Um, we don't know is the short answer. What we do know is that um, he, uh, during that time, there were still tolls and things were allowed. So this was not entirely centralized. Uh, all the money going up to the Targaryens, whoever local lords could. Um, do tolls on things um, so there was an element of decentralization the implication is that this carried on the same way it did during most of the time of the Targaryens which is this kind of typical feudal bottom-up approach um, that uh, you know the peasants pay some money to their local lord or a percentage of what they get uh, goes up there and then a percentage of what the local lord gets heads up and the money sort of, sort of funnels up to the top um and then you get some things and we don't know uh, we don't have a full list but we have some things across the seven kingdoms that seem to be taxed centrally port usage seems to be a central tax um and also things like wines as well luxury products and then finally we have King's Landing itself and the Crown Lands, which are run directly by House Targaryen or by the, the monarch, the Iron Throne. And in the Crown Lands and in King's Landing itself, they can set taxes directly however they want. And we see this lots of different times than through history. We're going to set a tax on you know, one, one copper if you want to enter the gates or um, taxes on... Uh, luxury goods or what, whatever it is. So they, they can come up with lots of different taxes there. We don't have anything on specifics that Bloodraven did. So the implication is that he wasn't so much caring about the economics of the Seven Kingdoms. He was caring about the security of the Seven Kingdoms um, uh, put against Blackfire rebellions, uh, but also getting his range of informants going. Um, 
So let's go to a question from Catherine Furseth saying, Hi, Robert, what do we actually know about Shira Seastar and her magical powers? I find it both strange and suggestive that Egg is one of the sources to what is being said about her, uh, meaning that this is probably what Targaryen family members think among themselves. Now, you've got the quote here um, that I, I've talked around this a little bit earlier, but you've got the exact quote here. So Dunk says, you've known queens and princesses. Did they dance with demons and practice the black arts? And then Egg goes, Lady Shearer does, Lord Bloodraven's paramour. She bathes in blood to keep her beauty. Um, any thoughts on her real powers or her perceived morally? You also asked about Shira Seastar, uh, so I'll wrap that question up here as well. Um, so her mother, Shira Seastar's mother, uh, this is another one of the um, uh, the paramours, the, the mistresses of Aegon IV, of course. Um, she was, for, I think, from Lys, certainly from Essos, and she was reputed to be a magic user herself. And she was reputed to know and use magic that kept her looking young, which is, again, what we've got going on here with Shira Seastar. Now, Shira Seastar allegedly was the most beautiful woman in the Seven Kingdoms. But Egg says that she does this through magic and, and also quite um, grim magic. She bathes in blood to keep her beauty. Um, and dancing with demons and practicing black arts, yes, she does that. So uh, even the people within the Targaryens, I agree completely, it's so suggestive that this there is some truth to this. Now, what magic does she have? We're not told. We're not told much about many of the women, the female Targaryens in this story, but the clear implication is that she is the big magic user. Um, and Blood Raven is kind of, well, he's obsessed with her. Um, he asks her to marry him several times. She always says no. Um, but the she is the one who learns magic, who knows magic, who got magic from her mother. And, and so this is not just, then perhaps this is why she and Blood Raven stand above the Targaryens in this in a way. She is not just getting the Targaryen magic in the same way that Blood Raven's not just getting the Targaryen magic. Blood Raven got magic from uh, his mother's side of the family, and so did Shira Seastar get magic from her mother's side of the family. I, th I suspect the uh, magic to keep you looking young probably is true, whether the bathing in blood is, who knows. Um, but uh, we simply haven't got the extent of it. One thing I will say, which is what I'm going to do in a, a Shira Seastar video at some point, again, spoiling future videos, is that I we, we don't know what happened to Shira Seastar. She kind of disappears off the page. Um, but we have to assume that she stayed, she, she survived. We didn't hear that she died in, the, um, in Summerhall. So she seems not to have been involved in that. Um, we don't hear everybody who was in some, involved in Summer Hall, but she wasn't one of the named people, and she probably would have been. Um, but she was a magic user. She was known to be a magic user by Egg. Um, and we know that Egg sent somebody over to a shy to be researching magical things, how to hatch a dragon egg. It had to be somebody he trusted completely, had to be somebody who understood magic, and it had to be somebody probably closely connected in with the Targaryens. The most of it is Shira Seastar. She can speak 12 languages. Um, uh, she's a magic user. She's in the family. Um, and her lover has gone now, so what's to up to the wall? So what what does she have left to keep her in King's Landing? She would be the obvious choice to go over to a shy and get this knowledge about how to hatch dragon eggs. My feeling is that if we follow that logic along, 
and then we say, okay, so um, if she's gone off there, <coughs> pardon me, got that information for Egg, she doesn't appear anywhere in the story after this. Maybe she stays in a shy. Maybe that she goes there. She learns how to, she already is long lived. She keeps on living, um, but she learns even more magic over in a shy. We know that she was very focused on magic. Why wouldn't she? A shy is a place where you can learn so much. And that is why I think when we get to Quaith, this character who clearly comes from a shy and then clearly is immediately focused on when word reaches where she is at that point at Carth. She's immediately fascinated by, hang on a moment, dragons, a Targaryen. And she comes out, she's one of the three people who comes out to meet Danny. And then she focuses on Danny. And then from that moment on, she is advising Danny, basically saying, you have to go west. Um, you have to invade Westeros. You're a Targaryen. The dragons remember who you are. And added to which, don't trust any of these other people. Only trust yourself. She is actually doing exactly what you would expect a Targaryen to be doing, who found another Targaryen with some dragons. Uh, so I think the Shira Sea Star equals Quaith equation is, is really quite strong. Uh, Yul Elson, thank you so much for the super sticker. Um, question from Eldrick Stoneskin saying, Morning, Robert. Hi there. Uh, do you think Bloodraven was lured north by the Three Eyed Crow to inhabit his body in the same way Bloodraven lured Bran north? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I was saying a little bit higher in earlier in the. Uh, live stream. The, the Three-Eyed Crow is not a job title, so there was not a Three-Eyed Crow before Blood Raven. There may well have been Children of the Forest there doing equivalent things, but that was not their job title. Did the Children of the Forest lure him north? I think yes. Um, did they lure him north in order to inhabit his body? Um, uh, I think they lured him north. He was he was an older man at this point. Yes, magically, he may well have been full of vim and vigor, but he was an older man by this point. Um, and hooking him up, somebody who his entire life down uh, down south in King's Landing had been about getting information and running things from behind the scenes, he was given the opportunity to hook himself up into the Weirwood Network, and I suspect he did that discovered what he could do with this and did not wish to leave. So I don't think, I mean, yes, bring, luring him is, is, is there, but I think that he was a willing participant in all of this. Um, Mara Lee, you asked about what Blood Raven was like as Lord Commander. We don't know all of the details. Um, the... <clears throat> What we do know is that during his time, this was almost certainly the last big influx of new people to um, the, uh, the the ranks of the Night's Watch. Um, we can be pretty certain that he got engaged with um, uh, the the ranging, so the going north of the wall side. Him going out on a ranging doesn't. It's never sort of written as like a oh what he inexplicably decided to go out on arranging no he he went out on arranging this seems to have been something that perhaps he would do relatively often or or at least it not be a, a shock um so i think he was probably pretty hands-on um but uh i think he connected well with maester aemon maester aemon doesn't say bad things about him which seems to imply that he um enjoyed that and the fact that Eamon has become so obsessed with prophecy I suspect that the link across to Blood Raven there is quite clear um, but beyond that we don't know, we're not told um, and that's a really quite frus uh, frustrating thing um, Brandy R in the chat saying I received my first compliment on my Blood Raven t-shirt 
I was at a supermarket and another a fan asked where I got it. Hopefully you will gain a new follower. Oh, well, that's, that really makes me happy. I'm glad that uh, about that. Uh, people seeing them out in the wild. This is, this is really good. Um, let's go to a question from Zakalok saying, Bonjour, Robert. Uh, bonjour. Uh, two questions. Can you explain the complex relationship between Blood Raven and the Woods Witch? Who uh, influenced who? Uh, indeed, even if they are symbolically connected, I don't see the Woods Witch being Blood Raven's puppet or close ally. We often associate Blood Raven with the tragedy of Summerhall, reducing the Targaryen bloodline, but the ghost of High Heart gorged on grief at Summerhall. Would she have knowingly let Blood Raven's plans lead to Jenny's death if they were working together? Um, well, it's an interesting question. So uh, I it's, unpack this a little bit earlier and i will definitely talk about this a lot more next time um but if they were allies of some kind does that mean that um she uh would have gone along with this tragedy at summerhall business i suspect he wouldn't have told her if he was involved i that doesn't he doesn't seem to be the person who really wants to be sharing plans um he seems to have had two purposes getting the woods witch down there assuming they're in, in in league in some way which i'm pretty sure they are uh the first one seems to be the marriage of duncan targaryen to jenny volstones she came down with jenny volstones uh, and then secondly it's this uh making sure that we get two of the children marrying each other uh so that the line of the prince that was promised can be established so that seems to have been mission accomplished. Um, her gorging on grief, this is what the uh, the Ghost of High Heart says. She gorged on grief at Summerhall. Um, I, I think, yeah, this is basically what seems to have happened, is that we got the tragedy at Summerhall. Jenny of Allstones almost certainly died there. And then the woods witch just hung around there for years and years afterwards. That's what we mean by her gorging on grief. Um, would she have known if Blood Raven did it? I, I think, I mean, it's hard to prove either way, but if Blood Raven was involved, he made it look like he wasn't uh, because it's th there's an obvious answer there in front. Of us that uh, we already know that there was there were pyromancers we know that there was wildfire we know that um, egg was trying to hatch dragon eggs this clearly involved setting fire to things um, and then you get the whole place burns down it's it's a really kind of straightforward of it actually doesn't need i mean this is the boring answer but it doesn't need another explanation it's only if we're looking into it and going might there be something more because that is mighty suspicious and george R. R. martin did make it appear mighty suspicious in the way that he wrote literal gaps in the account um in the world of ice and fire so we're we're supposed to feel suspicious about this um but for the people who were there, it may well not have appeared as suspicious because they weren't to know about you know this uh, literary device um, of uh, just uh, none of the people who survived ever wished to talk about it. And uh, we did get one report, but uh, some ink was spilt over it and we can't now read it. So that they don't really know about. That's just stuff that we, the readers, understand. For them experiencing it, just a big fire and they were playing with fire um <clears throat> kelly summers what was blood raven's tax policy over the gifts and do we know what his relationship was like with the starks and other northern lords no we don't the second half of this we do not know about his relationship we, we just don't have information really about that period of time which is a shame um blood raven's tax policy over the gifts so we've got uh, Brandon's Gift and the New Gift, which are two stretches of land just south of the wall. Now, the first one was given a long time ago, um, and the second one was given, the New Gift was given 
uh, by um, Alison and Jaharis. And the idea was that these um, bits of land, you would have people working on them, but instead of giving their, you know, the 10% or whatever it is to their local lord, they would give that to the Night's Watch. And that was how the Night's Watch survived, how they managed to um, get all the things they needed to do, the food and, and things like that, because they weren't farmers. Uh, they uh, they had some craftsmen up the wall, but not craftsmen for absolutely everything. So they needed uh, an income. Uh, now, Blood Raven, as far as we can tell, just left that going. Um, the thing that we don't know the exact extent of, by this point, the watch was much diminished from earlier days. And the implication is that after him, it's the time after that that it diminishes even more. We don't know the extent to which maybe he had a few extra forts manned, because by the time we get to the main story, there's only three forts, one in the middle, one on the right, one on the left, only three forts that they're uh, manned left. So um, his tax policy, as far as we can tell, towards the guests was just to keep it going. We don't get the impression that he was at the wall um, because that was where he thought his final destination was. At, certainly at some point when he went north of the wall, I suspect he knew he was heading to bigger and better things. Um, let's go to Zakalok saying um, the false spring... Um, this uh, actually, I might ask that about the fourth spring uh, next time because that's more about stuff that happened um, later. Um, Commander Ray saying, um, "Want to get your thoughts on the magic of the old gods and how it functions separately?" I think this is the question you asked actually in the chat. So um, uh, a little bit extra here though. Um, you're saying does. Um, uh, how it seems to function separately from almost the magic of the old gods, to, uh, separately to the magic, other magic in the world, which was seemingly reinvigorated by the birth of dragons, or rebirth of dragons. Um, the old god magic never seems to go away just forgotten. It doesn't seem to require sacrifice to use. It's more like a superpower. But if the Starks are anything to go by, it does require something to trigger it, either another green seer or a bond with a creature. Why do you think it works this way? Is it because that these powers derive from the children of the forest and they're about memory, something else? And how do you think Blood Raven discovered his power? And how advanced do you think they were prior to leaving for the war? So I'll unpack a little bit about um, the the difference. Which I, I talked a little bit about this earlier, but I, th I think there's a couple of extra things I can add. Difference between the... Um, magic of the old gods and other types of magic. The magic of the old gods seems very tied in with Westeros itself. Um, you say there's no need for sacrifice to use this magic, which is true. When I one of the kind of truisms that I come out with is that magic in the world of George R. R. Martin requires intentionality and sacrifice. Pretty much every type of magic requires those things. However, the um what we might call the old gods magic walking into a, an animal doesn't seem to require sacrifice not in the traditional way bran walking into summer he doesn't have to kill something first in order for it to work um which does seem different to most of the other kinds of magic we have um but Firstly, I'd say that it's not perhaps as universal as I sometimes try and make it out. Looking and in, gazing into the flames doesn't seem to have, and, and seeing visions doesn't seem to have a, um, a some sort of a sacrifice attached with it. Um, and the old gods, the worship of the old gods and the old gods' magic definitely does have an element of sacrifice to it. The, there are sacrifices to the weirwoods again and again and again. We see, we see sacrifices to the weirwoods. Um, when Bran's 
weirwood vision seem, needs to be unlocked, then he is given this weirwood paste. And if you've not come across the theory, but it's a very strong theory, um, that this is actually made from a sacrifice of Jojen. Um, rather grim, but sacrifice allows and enables the magic in some way. Um, and also you get um, the legends of the children of the forest using magic thousands of years ago um, f with the, the um, hammer of the waters, which was this great bit of magic they did to try and break the land bridge, succeeded in breaking the land bridge between Essos and Westeros, stopping the flow of humanity coming through. It was too little, too late for them. But in order to perform this magic, we're told that hundreds, thousands of uh, uh, children of the forest people were killed um, as a sacrifice to make the magic work. So sometimes the, the magic of the old gods does require that um, sacrifice. Um, it seems to be something, and exactly where the line is again, George R. R. Martin does not like this to be as clear cut as possible, but it seems to be something along the lines of is this going with the nature of the world or not? If you've got a bond with an animal, and then you walk into it, that's just part of the nature of the world. Um, if you are um, seeing green dreams, that this is not, they're, they're just dreams that sort of happen, then that doesn't need you to be um, making a sacrifice. If, however, you wish to create some massive uh, tsunami to be destroying a, an area of land, that is going against nature, and that does require some degree of sacrifice. It's not 100% clear. There will be tweaks and things around the outside of it, but that is the, the broad uh, breakdown that it seems to be, or to me anyway. Um. Uh, Karl Karsnack appears to be giving German lessons in, in the chat. Uh, Bat is the de Fle uh, de Fledermaus. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, which means the flying mouse. Um, so uh, I no idea how the chat got onto that. Uh, let's go to Callie Summers saying, Hi, Robert. I'll be sure to use the mug for the stream today. I think you, yeah, I gave the option for my. Um, Ten dollar patrons, if they wanted to get a mug rather than a, a, a t-shirt, then uh, they could definitely do that. I had a couple of Blood Raven questions, and one that came up in the chat last week: um, What are some of your anti-tinfoil ideas about Blood Raven? I.e., what are the some of the weird coincidences that happened in his sphere of potential influence that we probably shouldn't blame him for, or things that he was unprepared for? If Dunk is a bit of a magic repellent, would he have been a wild card that Dunk, that Bloodraven couldn't influence? Well, yes, Dunk is the classic example here, I think. Um, and it's quite hard to um, describe Dunk. It's not that he seems to be magic repellent so much as Dunk seems to be just non-magical. However, in Wheel of Time language, Taviran fate seems to swirl around him wherever he goes he um uh, decides to wander into uh a uh, join a tourney and what who does he run into he runs into two princes of the realm undercover hiding um in a pub um he goes to um gets uh, gets involved in saving um a puppet master's uh, daughter um, and in so doing he assaults a prince of the realm uh, he goes to another tourney and he stumbles into um, a full-blown rebellion against the crown this is he things happen around dunk just around, those are just a few random examples things yes we're telling the stories but this is not just this is not normal level this is He's some sort of a catalyst for what's going on. Um, but he is he seems to be confusing Bloodraven. At the moment, he seems to be confusing Bloodraven because Bloodraven 
doesn't quite understand what's going on, which is a fascinating because like, the the couple of times we've met, actually met Blood Raven, he does slightly um, defy our expectations because he's he's there basically debriefing Duncan Egg at the end of the story in the Mystery Night, and he's just trying to get information from them as much as they are trying to get information from him. It's like, why are you here? What on earth's going on? How did you? figure this out egg um why on earth didn't you figure that out dunk so it's like i don't quite get why you're here and he seems a little bit confused by this so this is something that it seems to be outside of his control to a degree um and also there are some other things that um when you said the anti-tinfall ideas i kind of ran over this a little bit earlier um, which is that I still absolutely subscribe to the best way to understand all of these uh, very uh, um, suspicious Targaryen deaths in such a short period of time. The best way to understand that is that uh, someone, probably Blood Raven, was operating behind the scenes to be winnowing down the family tree. Um, however, I don't think that all of those deaths were down to him. I think that you can look at Arian Bright Flame, Arian Targaryen, and I don't think that Blood Raven pushed him into that. I don't think that whatever happened to Deer and the Drunkard, and I, I suspect the 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 answer we're given um, is probably not the exact uh, answer, but um, he did. Blood Raven need to kill him? No, I don't. Th think he did. I think that that was probably something which was going to be happening anyway. I think that there are a lot of these kind of uh, things that did not require um, Blood Raven's intervention. I actually think um, that the, the whole Great Council thing probably wasn't necessary. All they had to do was get... Um, the only other serious candidate was Maester Eamon, and he, if he just like said, nope, I'm not doing it, then he could have just put Egg on the throne. Um, its purpose, or two purposes, one was to tempt out another Blackfire person that he could then kill, and two, to get some sort of buy-in from the Lords. Not not because he didn't know who he wanted, but because he need, needed some kind of buy-in from people to say, to, to give Egg a head start, because they would they would really dislike him, the noble lords, when he became king, and everybody knew it. But if they had formally agreed that this person is going to become king, then that does give Egg a little bit of a little bit of leeway. Um Okay, so uh, that actually, I now I've got one more question from my patrons. So as I as I said at the beginning, what I'm doing here is I'm breaking the blood rate of the stream into half. Otherwise, I suspect it would go well over six seven hours. Um, the second half next week, what I'm going to be covering is the period from north of the wall. So all of these questions about. Um, uh, Blood Raven um, and the Three Eyed Crow, and uh, how this interacts with Bran's story, how he ended up being uh, hooked up to the Weirwood Network, what might he have possibly been doing, walking into Ghost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of those questions I will be covering next week. Patrons, if you're if you're if you didn't catch me the couple of times I mentioned it already, if you asked a question over on Patreon that I have not covered this week, that's because I'm holding it for next week so I can cover um, that part of the story then. Uh, but now is a good time to be dropping any more questions into the chat. Um, uh, I will try and get through as many as I possibly can. Lady Pushkins uh, asks... What do you think is Blood Raven's ultimate plan? Is he a warg as well as a green seer? So I will, uh, on the second bit, is he a warg? Yes, absolutely. I'm I'm sure he is. Um, I will use this, the first half of it. What's his ultimate plan? To tease where I think we're going to be going next time. Which is, his ultimate plan is to be getting the prince that was promised 
with everything the prince that was promised the prince that is promised needs at the right place at the right time that is where he's he's going for and he has decided that the prince that was promised is john so his ultimate plan is to manipulate it to create he didn't he probably didn't know that this was going to be john but he did know that this was going to be the result of um targaryen who's come down from that pure line that he created <clears throat> and a stark to getting some more of that uh, northern old gods magic into the mix um and the the child of those two becomes the prince that was promised when that child ends up at the war at the wall um then starting to find the things and the people that he needs so what do you need now uh, oh dragon glass here's a whole load of dragon glass what do you need now well you need to have the horn of winter what do you need now you need to know how to be destroying uh, the others here's this list of things that he needs and and he's working his way through it so that john ends up in the right place with the right tools and the right team in order to be doing what he must do by prophecy um Uh, Kaspanner was saying, why was he imprisoned by Makar? If Makar in the realm hated him, or why wasn't he imprisoned by Makar? If Makar in the realm hated him so much, why was he his hand? Why did Makar hate him? Hatred of magic or just jealousy? So um, Makar seems to have disliked Bloodraven because Makar thought that he should have been made hand of the king. Um, and Bloodraven was. Now, this the, the implication is that Maker and um, well, whether it's Maker and Maker's uh, family is a, is a different issue, were at odds with the overall approach that um, was being taken by the Targaryens at the time a very prophecy driven, very magic driven approach. The irony is that Maker's four sons were all incredibly magical. They were prophetic. They got dragon dreams themselves. So my best guess is that once Makar came to be king and he allowed he allowed Bloodraven to carry on being Hand of the King because, um, well, he'd lost two of his children basically already. Arian was, uh, and, and Deiran were not, they were not kingly material. Uh, another one was Aemon, who was down in the citadel. Um, and then we get Egg. So he called all his children to him when he became king. Um, but really, none of them were Hand of the King material. And he might as well just let Bloodraven carry on. So that, that I think, is what it is. Um, I, I think the, the hated could well be overstated um it's most often raised by in the duncan egg stories by people who are trying to sow discontent within the realm people who are black fire sympathizers and um they wish to paint within this they wish to paint their their great opponent in this is Blood Raven, and so they are wishing to paint Blood Raven as this terrible character. And one way of doing that is by saying, "Hey, even somebody in his own family doesn't like him," um, and that's just another sort of thing that they can throw into the mix. Um, Casper and Reese say, "Is there some significance to um, Blood Raven using a moonstone to glamour?" versus a ruby like uh, ruby like Melisandre. Could Dunk see beyond the illusion because a moonstone isn't as strong? Well, it's possible. So, yeah, there was uh, Bloodraven, book spoilers, uh, almost certainly, 95% certainly, is glamoured in the Mystery Night as a guy called Maynard Plum. Now, um, the 
he doesn't appear to have a, a ruby. Um, he uses different gem. Now, is, is that why Dunk can see through it? Because he can sort of... When Dunk, uh, he never questions these things. This is the, the fascinating thing about Dunk, is that he sees something weird and he just like just carries on. Um, and he looks and he sees his face, and I can't remember the exact phrasing, but basically the closer he looked, the less he could see of it. Um, and we think, oh, this is a glamour that's going on there. I personally think it's not anything to do with the quality of the glamour because nobody else seems to be having these issues. Um, it's just Dunk. And Dunk, as I said, he just seems to be non-magical. And so maybe it is that this magic that's been done there it's not that it doesn't work on him. It's just it, it's harder work on him because Dunk's just not in tune with it at all. That would be my general take on that one. Um, Lady Pushkins, does Blood Raven use weirwood, pardon me, weirwood paste similar to how warlocks use Shade of the Evening, possibly some magical ability? So weirwood paste and Shade of the Evening seem to be kind of opposites that achieve broadly similar things. That's... Um, uh, that's how that kind of balance seems to work, uh, and it, it's it's used to unlock your powers. So, Blood Raven will have used Weirwood Paste in order to first access the Weirwood Network when he went up there. What we don't know, because we've not really had that many brand chapters yet up there, is the extent to which you need to use it every time. When you get the Shade of the Evening um, drink. It, it Euron seems to be using it every time he just wants to kind of like access this uh, uh sort of more, more magical spiritual realm, uh, get the dreams and visions, and he's just downing glasses of it all the time. Um, that is sending him even more crazy. It's possible that you don't need to do that. Um, with the weirwood paste, we don't know. He certainly used it once, maybe more. Um, Eldrick Stoneskin saying, Why does Bran have blue eyes when it said green seers were born with green and red eyes? In even though Bran is potentially the strongest green seer, that's always had me confused. Uh, yeah, the eyes thing, I think, is George R. R. Martin plays with eyes, eye color a lot, um, and it's indicative rather than uh, completely something you can rely on is my general view um he's I, I think if he set up a world where everything was just you can tell if somebody's magic by the color of their eyes then that wouldn't feel like a a, a full um fully rounded world in my view so i think that's what's going on here i think it's nothing more complicated than that um Kelly Summers saying, uh, I like in Dungeons and Dragons, you can't charm creatures if their intelligence is too low. Are you trying to say that's what's going on with Dunk? Um, uh, Commander Ray saying, Dunk is the kind of guy who has a ghost destroy his room and show itself, and he'd just ask who's there and go back to sleep like nothing happened. Yeah. Um, Andrew Kay saying, you can question Blood Raven's methods, but anyone in close proximity would realize his value on your side. Hence why Makar came around and retained him. I think that's absolutely true. Um, Makar wanted him on his side rather than against him. Um, devoted to Maria, why did Egg let Blood Raven take Dark Sister North? That's odd. That sword is supposed to be handed down through the Targaryen line. Great question. Um, and I have a whole video coming up on that. And it's another collaboration with History and Westeros. So um, I will, I'm working through that one now, and I will give you a full answer in a video if that's okay. Um, uh, Mike Hanna saying, do we need to repost our Beyond the Wall and Blood Raven endgame questions on Patreon next week, or will they be automatically pulled over? No, I've pulled them. I've extracted them already. They're all here waiting uh, on I have basically a Word document, basically, where I cut and paste everything over to. I've, I've got them. I've filtered them out so I know which ones we're doing next week. So you don't need to repost it. I will put a little thing up on Patreon um, in case there are any more questions, but you don't need to repost the ones that are there already. Um, uh, let's, uh, oh, sorry, kind of fine art. Hi there. Good to see you. Um, uh, I think with this, however, I am going to 
uh, start to draw this one to a close. So next week we are going to be coming back with part two of this. And uh, that's going to be looking at Blood Raven beyond the wall. Uh, Blood Raven as the Three-Eyed Crow. Uh, and what's his role in the story going forward? Not just what's happening right now, um, but what might happen in the next couple of books. Um, so you've got that to look forward to. I've got videos coming out um, tomorrow and Monday, I think. I'm going to try and get it two to three videos per week on this channel. Uh, not on this channel, on the main channel. Um, and then on this channel... I'll be getting the short uh, form videos back up and running again soon. Okay, I think that is all for this time. Thank you again, patrons. Thank you, moderators. Um, some wonderful questions this time around. Um, if you are watching this back a little bit later, appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to uh, some more uh, live streams. If you'd like to watch that, appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to my Patreon page if you would like to support this channel. Uh, that's all for this time. I will be back sex same time next week. Take care, everyone. I shall see you soon.